This happened when I was 16. It was Halloween in my small town of South Louisiana. It was a crisp night. The temperature was in the mid 80s, and the heat showed no sign of slacking off. I was walking around with my older sister, and our friend Brooke. My sister had gone as a cat, and Brooke had gone as a witch. I had made the awful decision of wearing a formal gown, since I decided to go as a zombie prom queen. I had a crown and everything. I was drowning in that dress though. It was so hot, and the corset back was restricting my breathing. It was around 840, and all of the kids were pretty much cleared out of the street. We were making our way to the park next to City Hall, where my mother was supposed to pick us up. We were supposed to be there for nine. The three of us were about six blocks away at this point, and my sister had stopped to talk to a friend of hers. I was not stopping though. It was close to time for my mum to pick us up, and I wasn't going to be late. I was also miserable in that stupid dress and wanted to go home. I had carried on for almost two blocks before I'd noticed that both my sister and her friend had stayed behind. I was annoyed to say the least, but I only had four more blocks to go, and I could lay down in my mother's minivan. Being alone in the dark was starting to give me the creeps. The yellow streetlights didn't do the ambience any favours. I'd kept my pace and kept walking, until I heard the rumble of a muffler coming up behind me. I moved all the way off the road. The large black truck came past very quickly and turned to the left in front of me. I passed the intersection, and I only had three blocks left. Then I heard the truck again. I'd never moved back on the road, so I didn't bother looking back. It wasn't too strange that the same truck had passed again. The third time they passed though, they slowed for a good 30 seconds or so, and that's what scared me. I didn't recognize the truck and the windows were tinted heavily. As soon as I thought I could see a bit of a face, they peeled out and disappeared around a corner. I made another block before I heard the truck again. I was two blocks away from my ride, and I was scared and started running. I already couldn't breathe because of the dress, and was terrified I would pass out. As soon as I heard the truck, my stomach wrenched, I still kept going, only good bit faster than I had been. I kept my eyes down and watched my own shadows as the headlights came closer. I heard the brakes and I had made the decision to run, but I was too late. I realized how close they were to me. I felt a sharp pain on the back of my head and I looked up the best I could to see an arm sticking out of the window. An eagle clutching a sword was tattooed on his upper forearm. He had my hair wrapped around his fist. Before I could really comprehend the situation, he pumped the gas and was dragging me alongside of his truck. I was running as best I could, clawing his arm, crying and screaming. The only thing that kept running through my mind was that if I tripped, I was going to be run over. This man was just laughing. I was completely helpless. As soon as it started, he let me go. I fell to my knees on the asphalt, tore my dress, skinned my palms, and my scalp was on fire. I was inconsolable, and I was hyperventilating. I stood up, wiped my face, then looked around and felt absolutely violated. I looked back at the way I'd come from and realized that this man had dragged me by my hair for a whole block and a half. Once I caught my head, I ran across the street to the park. My mother was nowhere to be seen. I climbed into the enclosed slide and just curled up and cried. I don't know how long I was lying there for before I heard my mother calling my name. I came out and she was walking up the street calling for me. 
I walked over to her and she looked me up and down and began freaking out. Apparently, I had blood on my face and dress from my hands. She ran to me and was asking me what happened and kept looking me up and down for a gash or something worse. I couldn't find my voice. I just held on to her and cried. We spent the next few hours at the police station filling out a report. Long story short, nothing ever came of it. My sister got into trouble with my parents for not being at the city hall on time. She was grounded. My mother had actually left city hall to go and look for us. She found my sister where I left her and my sister hadn't even realized that I never stayed. I got in trouble for not staying with my sister, but I didn't get grounded. I'm still pretty mad that the dress was ruined and I lost the damned crown. I'm even angrier that the man was never caught. This Halloween, I will be out with my godchild trick or treating. It'll be the first one that I've gone out for in the nine years since it happened. I used to be a duty manager at a 250 bed hotel in the UK. It was built on the seafront in 1828. I would often sit with the girls on the front desk in the evenings if I wasn't busy, mostly because they were nice and also because the place, despite being beautiful, was creepy as hell at night. The elevator would often ding, open up and go up and down and stop by itself. It was always perfect when the engineer came to look at it though. There were often reports from guests that a dog was running in the halls, always the same description, and it would disappear. Someone came down from their room, telling us a man was there, and we had to send someone up to make sure. They switched rooms. New waiting staff would often approach a woman in the dining hall, looking out to see, for her to disappear before they got to her. Part of my job was to do the security slash fire checks. I had to tour the building's dark basements with a flashlight. In the basement, there are arched rooms that were once used for storage linens, cleaning materials and foods. They looked like empty little prison cells now. Luckily, the maintenance men would escort me around most nights. It was spooky. My name is Noah, and this is an experience that happened to me a few years ago. I used to live in East St. Louis and was 17 at the time of these events. I am 19 now. After all of this, I moved and have since been living in the Twin Cities. I'd say I, at least, think about what happened once a week. Now, coming from a place like East St. Louis, I have my fair share of stories to tell, but out of all of them, this one is by far the scariest. I used to hang out with this girl from high school I liked called Charlotte. I met Charlotte in sophomore year, and we often hung out outside of St. Louis in Weldon Springs. This was at her grandparents' place, which is a suburb further away. Despite her being a social outcast, she seemed to gain the attention of some people as she was attractive. One of which was someone at her previous school she transferred from freshman year and somehow befriended. His name was Zeke. Initially, I didn't find him weird. We hung out a few times, none of which were really bad. It's just that he gave off not so good vibes. However, when it was just me and Charlotte hanging out at her place, Zeke showed up unannounced. This was one of the many warning signs he gave that he wasn't really good to be around. Me and her were laying down on her couch when we saw headlights outside. I knew it was Zeke because he pulled up in his crappy and poorly maintained Toyota Corolla. This annoyed us both in some ways. He didn't exactly pick up on social norms. 
He wasn't autistic or anything, but he was strange. So basically he just came in and dampened our day, which was pretty normal for whenever he came over. I could list all the other things he did, but it would take too long. If it wasn't enough, he owned quite a bit of expensive stuff, including the car. He was our age, didn't have a job, nor did he live with his family. So it's safe to assume he got into his fair share of trouble. I don't think I need to explain why where I lived was terrible. If you think of the Bronx, South Chicago, or even Detroit, it's bad. But then you haven't been to East St. Louis. I hated it so much there. I would often stay at Charlotte's grandparents' place and would periodically skip school. And having this Zeke kid didn't exactly make me feel any safer living here. Me and Charlotte went to school together. However, as I said earlier, Zeke did not, and went to school on the Illinois side, while me and Charlotte went to Missouri. We were both sitting at the lunch table together when I heard someone's voice shouting, not so much in a threatening way, but to get someone's attention. When I heard Charlotte's name being called, I turn around and saw Zeke, which creeped me out as he didn't go to our school. It wasn't just him though. Several of his friends came by. I got confused when I heard one of his friends say, Who's that Asian bitch? Right away, I knew in some way that Zeke was talking about Charlotte amongst his friends. He only had two friends with him, but he would always talk about being with many more, which I wouldn't put past his crazy ass, to be honest. They were generally just being annoying. So after the third time, his asshole friend got into Charlotte's personal space. I announced to them that if they didn't piss off, I'd beat their asses. They didn't take it well, and one of his friends came close to me and shoved me in the cafeteria seat. Without giving too much unnecessary detail, a fight broke out until the deans broke it off and realized that him and his friends didn't belong there and the cops came. And as to what they did to them, I don't know. It was probably them being let off with a warning or something petty. I, on the other hand, was suspended for a few days and stayed home. Me and Charlotte were messaging each other one night at two in the morning. I had woken up to something that was going on outside my house, and as such, decided to go and grab a snack. I sat down at the kitchen counter, watching YouTube videos on my phone. When I got a message from Charlotte, it was obviously unexpected, and I opened it right away. This was on Snapchat, and it was a picture snap. It was a selfie with the caption, I can't sleep. I didn't bother sending a snap back and instead messaged her, How come? I don't know, she replied. We spoke for a good minute about stuff that didn't matter, until she brought up that someone was close near her house leaving their headlights on. I initially asked if she knew the car, so I could figure it out if it was Zeke in his crappy blue Corolla. She said that it wasn't. It was a dark gray, probably black Honda Accord. As much as she tried brushing it off, I just couldn't. It gave me really bad vibes. We started to talk about irrelevant stuff and eventually fell asleep. However, once I was able to go back to school, Charlotte wasn't there. I didn't see her in any classes, and I messaged her to see if she was okay. While I can't say for certain, I just didn't get good vibes. What I mean by this is she generally seemed more distant. Her responses were shorter, not as if she hated me, but more like I was somehow dangerous to her. The next few days, she wasn't in school either, and I began to get genuinely worried. However, I spoke to Zeke about this, who pretty much hated me at this point. And after asking him on Snapchat and Instagram if she was okay, he blocked me. I began to feel hopeless. However, what I am about to tell you next was crucial in me finding out more. I stayed after school to finish an English assignment. When I heard some idiots outside being obnoxious, I looked out and who did I see? other than Zeke and his few friends. I ignored them initially, 
but when their chatter finally got to a halt, I looked out again. He got into his car and drove away. But when I saw Zeke's friends getting into a car matching Charlotte's description of a dark grey Honda, my eyes widened, and I got a bad feeling. Later that night when I got home, I texted Charlotte to check on her, but she wasn't responding. A day passed by. She didn't open my message. And that's when I walked through the neighborhood and stopped at her dad's place. He answered the door and asked what I wanted and asked if he knew where Charlotte was. Her dad sighed and gave me a look of what I can only describe as devastation. His demeanor changed from angry and aggressive to downright hopeless. He told me that Charlotte left a few days ago and hasn't returned since. I asked if she told where she was going, but he didn't know. That's when I explained to him she hasn't replied to any of my texts, and I did the same thing with their grandparents, but they said they hadn't seen or heard from her either. Immediately, any optimism in me was gone, and I felt like giving up. Charlotte didn't have many friends and neither did I, so it was almost just always us talking together. A few days later, after no response, I went to the police station and told them that she was missing. I went on to say that I suspected Zeke and his friends of being involved in what happened. After nothing happening for a day or so, I got a snap from Charlotte. My eyes widened in excitement. However, that excitement quickly went away when I saw a selfie of someone that wasn't her. He was in some worn down, derelict as hell building. I knew this because a lot of the wall and roof was missing and it showed the street light from outside. I replayed the snap to see if anything stood out to no avail. If I remember properly, it was probably one of his friends because of a blue bandana he wore. There was no caption and I wanted to respond, but I knew it wasn't her. I got so frustrated that I called the police and told them about my situation. To make it short, they said that they would investigate, whatever that meant. I visited Charlotte's grandparents and stayed the night, not wanting to go to school the next day. I spoke to some people on Snapchat and Messenger, and at the same time was trying to find something to do about this. I began talking to one of my middle school friends who lived in another suburb called Eddie. While he didn't know Charlotte, he knew Zeke, and had added him on Snap. It was a silly idea, but they actually talked, which I didn't even expect at all. The next day after school, I met up with Eddie, and he requested Zeke's location on Snap. He was clearly stupid, because about five minutes later, Eddie pulled up his phone and his location was somewhere north of St. Louis. He turned his location off, and we took an Uber to the location. Zeke's bitmoji eventually changed, from the one area he was at, back to East St. Louis. We figured it would be worth a shot trying to see where he was, and if Charlotte was there. The sun was starting to set, but we went anyway. Once we arrived, we were at the building that Zeke's bitmoji was over. And well, judging by the appearance of them, it must have looked like it. There were two floors, and the upper floor had a lot of the wall and roof destroyed. In fact, it looked identical to the one sent to me that I saw in the snap. I knew Charlotte was there. She had to be. I decided to call her, and what happened next still makes my blood run cold. The actual fear I felt was pretty unmatched. As soon as I hit call, the ringing from the phone in my ear was quickly overshadowed by a loud ringtone coming from inside the warehouse. My eyes widened in terror, and the look on Eddie's face was just as terrifying. Despite the occasional car coming, it was pretty silent. But when I heard footsteps on the concrete and debris from upstairs, I crapped myself inside after seeing something. Barely illuminated by the streetlight was the silhouette of a figure standing near the open wall. It wasn't bright enough to see who, but either way, both of us ran and didn't look back. Once we thought it was safe, we called an Uber back. 
and the next day after school I returned to the police station and updated the cops with my findings, and told them about what I had found. However, the same officer I had told what I had found seemed to be getting annoyed with me, and I gave up on him. He said an officer would be sent over, and that they would call me back. That's when I decided to take the next step in what was becoming my own investigation. Several days went by at school, and I returned next weekend back to her grandparents' place to update them and told them what I'd found. They'd left and gone to the police station on their own and came back after. In the next few hours, the police station called back and updated me. They had gone to the abandoned warehouse, and I asked them what they found. They said, nothing. That annoyed me so much, and I didn't even show it to the officer how much I was angry. I ended the call, almost ready to give up hope. I updated Eddie on what I found, and the first thing he checked was Zeke's location, but he wasn't on the map anymore. After this, I decided I'd go further. Charlotte was pretty much my only real friend, and she meant the world to me, and I wasn't going to let her go missing or anything. It was Sunday now, and I was at her grandparents feeling empty, so I went for a walk. I stopped at a nearby playground and just rested, got extremely bored, and was so burnt out that I almost napped at the picnic table outside. That's when I got a notification on Snapchat. Charlotte has added you as a friend. I opened and accepted it. Then I began to talk to her. I asked her if she was okay, but she kept giving me the same short response she would before and then stopped replying altogether. Then next, I decided for whatever reason to look on the Snapchat map. I made the terrible mistake of forgetting to turn mine off because when I looked on Snap Map, I saw Charlotte's Bitmoji right next to mine at the same park. It was broad daylight, and with this I studied my surroundings very quickly before deciding I shouldn't stay. I began to run in the opposite direction of where her location was, and in one quick move, turned around, and for the briefest moment, I saw someone standing off in the distance. Whoever that was, it wasn't Charlotte. I didn't take any time to observe, I just bolted and didn't go back. I went back on the app after I'd ran for several minutes and turned off my location. However, I saw that her bitmoji was no longer at the park, but going down the same street I was. This freaked me out even more. I looked behind me and saw off in the distance the familiar figure of Zeke. This was my cue to run. I turned, running past her grandparents' house, and took many turns and didn't stop walking. It was a good five minutes later at this point that I called the cops, saying someone was chasing me. I gave them my location and the location of the park, and despite how repetitive me calling the cops had become, they looked everywhere for Zeke but couldn't find him or his car. To prevent him from going to her grandparents' place, the officer gave me a ride back to mine and told me to stay safe. Now, if that was Charlotte, she would have called me, sent a snap of herself at least, or something. Obviously, it wasn't. It was Zeke, and he was attempting to get me, which almost worked. Monday through Friday at school consisted of asking people if they knew who Charlotte was, or if they had seen her. I was so close to giving up, and doing something that realistically didn't help, but I felt obligated to. I was so hell-bent on getting answers and making progress that I resorted to doing it. But to my surprise, on Thursday, one of the freshman girls said she did. I asked her everything and if she knew where Charlotte was. She didn't know much about her, but instead directed me to one of her friends on Messenger, who was apparently a close friend of hers. I spoke to them back and forth for a few days, and when we started talking, she asked me if I knew someone called Liam. I didn't. But when she described the dude with the blue bandana, my stomach dropped. I told her about the snap I got sent from Charlotte's account that had someone of that description taking a selfie in it. 
To add on to that, I told her about the abandoned looking building. Oh, and in case you're wondering, I did check and know her location was not on snap map like it usually was. That was the first thing I checked when I received the snap. We began to plan some kind of thing to find her, but I gave up. The next night during a weekend I was staying up watching YouTube, where I saw headlights beaming through the blinds and tires against the pavement. I stopped and was frozen with fear. As soon as I heard a car door open and close, I didn't take any chances whatsoever. I opened my bedroom window and climbed out, running across my yard and into the neighbor's yard. I hid, but when I heard the sound of glass being shattered from the distance, I lost it and wanted to break down crying. I called the police and told them a break-in was going down. The only amazing thing about living in St. Louis was the fast response time, because within a few minutes the cop arrived, and I heard a familiar voice scream loudly, Run! I kid you not, there were footsteps exiting through the back door and through my yard, and coming closer. I felt extremely stupid for not running further, but if I hadn't stayed in the nearby yard, I would have even known a break-in occurred. I ran across the block, and from the distance I saw officers jumping the fence and chasing the guys, one of which was Liam. To make it short, I walked back over and my mum and I filled a statement. My laptop and several things were stolen, but that didn't matter now. I told the cops about how they were involved in one of my friends going missing. However, the next thing I'm about to tell you was the last to happen in this situation, and was the worst of it all. A few days later at 2am, I heard my phone start chiming. I got frustrated at first, thinking it was my alarm going off, but that's when I saw a number I didn't recognize. I got extremely uneasy for some reason, and I decided to answer it. I am honestly so glad I did. I heard heavy breathing, not cliche, creepy heavy breathing, but panicked, more high-pitched breathing. And then I heard a familiar voice that wasn't Zeke's. It was Charlotte. Hey, Noah. She sounded panicked. Wait, Charlotte? She sounded like she was about to start talking again until she cut herself off. The last thing I heard before the phone got disconnected was the sound of loud footsteps against concrete, shattering glass and other debris and rubble. There was a gasp before the line got disconnected. I was fed up with this. I called the cops yet again and told them that I needed the number traced and gave them the number that called me. They traced the location, which turns out wasn't coming from the abandoned warehouse where I thought she was at previously. She was in a completely different location southwest of St. Louis. I took my mum's car and drove to the location they brought up. Called me stupid, but I wanted to see it for myself. I stayed over the phone with the operator, and despite his constant warnings to not go, I didn't listen. Once I got there, I stayed nearby in the car. Without waiting too long, I saw the cops pull up. Two officers went in, and I waited further for something. Since I decided to head over to the location, the operator had me stay on the phone, and I watched as multiple other squad cars arrived. I parked further away and watched in almost sadistic amusement as I saw someone being dragged out by two officers who was actively struggling. And through my window I could hear him screaming. One of the officers grabbed his taser and shocked him. It was Zeke. I got the okay from the operator and stepped out. From there I approached the officer and explained I was the one who called and reported this. We spoke, but I won't bore you with all the legal stuff. In my peripheral vision, I saw an officer escorting someone out. My eyes widened with joy as I saw Charlotte. I called her name and she looked over to me, coming over and running to hug me. She had several marks on her body and her face. I can say this. You can tell just how much someone is emotionally or in generally scarred due to their reaction. She hugged me so tight and began to cry. I literally felt like suffocating. That's how tight it was. She admitted to me and the officers that she was hardly fed, beaten, and didn't elaborate much more. I'm surprised out of all of the things that they did to her, 
they didn't do something far worse. Who knows? They might have. She might be too scared to tell me about it. In addition, she said that she was carried into the Honda Accord. However, for some reason, this was on the same day that I returned to school, and I asked her about how come she was able to message me, and she said that she never did. That confirms that once she stopped showing up to school, it was Zeke the whole time. But besides that, Zeke being found here while screaming and resisting arrest was already enough evidence. She pressed charges, and I watched in sheer excitement as he was carried away in a squad car. I gave him the finger as he went off. This whole situation didn't get any media coverage, which I'm actually thankful for. I gave Charlotte a ride to her grandparents after everything with the Cox was settled. To give some answers, she was being held in captivity by Zeke and his friends at this abandoned warehouse. After me and Eddie searched for it and found where they were, they moved locations. Later, after some court stuff which I wasn't involved with, she told me that Zeke admitted that he was planning on selling her to someone to pay off some money that he owed. He was sentenced to 25 to life for multiple charges, a lot of which was stuff I didn't know. Besides, on the obvious taking of a person, theft and other things. He was also charged with homicide, arson, possession, use of drugs, amongst other things. Besides all that, all I can say is that I'm glad Charlotte is okay. As much as I wish I could have gotten Zeke myself or something like that, I'm glad he's in jail. Charlotte moved in with her grandparents and transferred to another school, and I transferred as well, moving out to where I am now. Charlotte and I have been talking ever since, and there's no point in telling how she is. It's not really related to any of this, but overall, we're both doing better now. Almost all the time, all you hear in these stupid false media stories are about the murder capitals of the country being the Bronx, South Chicago, and Los Angeles. And while yes, those places are bad, Central East St. Louis and St. Louis in general has the worst murder and crime rate of any city in the US, period. All I can say is this, I feel extremely fortunate to have made it out of there, and don't think I could name a worse place to live in. It was a weekend in late October, and I was walking home alone from my friend's dorm on my college campus, Penn State. It was around 2.30 a.m. As I get closer towards my dorm, there's a patch that's not so lit up and is rather dark. I was proceeding to walk up the sidewalk, but a feeling of eeriness overcame me. All of a sudden, a shadow came from the bushes. I stopped and immediately froze. The dark, shadowy man said coaxingly, Come here. I know you. Come here. He was gesturing me to come towards him. I then turned around and ran fast as hell up the road and screamed for my life. I looked back and the man was chasing after me. Luckily, there were people walking down the road and started running up towards the main road with me and told me to keep running. To my amazement, there happened to be a police car at the top of the hill. I gave the policeman all the information I had seen and knew of. Eventually, later on, they found a man with a rubber mallet. I had to identify the man and the police told me he was a student. They also said the most they could do was file a student misconduct report with the university because it was a he said, she said type of situation. They then just let him go walk free. I felt that there should have been more that they should have done. I was escorted to my dorm, but for days I was even afraid to leave my room in case he came back and recognized who I was. I could have been overreacting, but I was never so freaked out in my life. This kid was definitely an offie. The kids that helped me were super sweet. 
They stayed with me the entire time I talked to the police, and the girl invited me to stay over in her dorm if I felt uncomfortable to go back to mine. The last thing I wanted to do though was sleep in a complete stranger's dorm, but the gesture was appreciated and in the right place. I thanked them, and they seemed just as freaked out as me. I'm not sure if it was just some stupid Halloween prank to get a good scare in me, but I feared for my safety and that of others. I now carry pepper spray with me at all times on campus, and always remember to walk with a friend. The reality is, you never think this can happen to you until it does. I should have listened to my mum, when she always told me to never be alone and walk with someone. I've been a hotel night auditor for eight and a half years without much trouble. The hotel where I work, night auditors always work alone, unless we were training someone new. We always lock our front entrance automated doors at midnight. One night around 1am a guy comes to the door. I called the entrance phone and ask how I can help him. He says that he needs to rent a room, so I buzz him in. He comes to the counter and asks the rate. When I tell him the price, he asks if he can use the restroom. He comes back and insists he needs water. I tell him where the faucet is, which is right next to the restroom that he just used. By this time, I think he's gonna rob me. I feel like telling him just to rob me to get it over with, and he comes back from getting water and asks if he can use the phone. He can't work the hotel phone because you have to dial nine for an outside line, and that confuses him. So I dial the number for him, and my hands are shaking so badly that I have to try and dial it a few times. Instead of asking him the number, I write it down, and when I finally get it right, there's no answer on the other line. Then, this guy leaves. I swear to myself that I will not open the doors for anyone else tonight. And around 4am a different guy comes to the door and asks if he can use the phone. I'm not opening it for anyone, so I ask the number, and I go to call it. And I realise it's the same number the first guy gave me. I can only see one person standing in front of all the glass doors, but I hear someone coughing, and it's not the guy I'm talking to. I know something is up, and instead of calling the number, I call the cops. Five minutes later, two cop cars pull up. The first guy runs into the woods, and the second guy is still in the entrance, unable to run. The cop comes in to let me know what's going on. Earlier that night, there was a big fight at a trailer park down the road, and these guys were involved, and the police have been looking for them all night. People were hurt pretty bad because of these guys. The two guys had to get away and had no phone, so they were trying to make a call for a ride out of town. If they would have been upfront with me from the beginning about needing to use the phone instead of freaking me out, they might have gotten away. About 11 months ago, I started working at a big corporate retail store that specializes in tech, mostly high-end goods, part-time. I'm a female who's six foot tall and in my late twenties, a former NCAA water polo player. My job at said store was more behind the scenes. My primary duties were to answer calls and assist with orders, complaints, and scheduling via the phones. My secondary duties would be to assist the front lanes when lines got long. I'm a friendly, outgoing person and love to chat with customers. Some regulars I joke about with about various topics, but nothing ever that would be considered unprofessional nor suggestive, and I've never expressed any interest in any customer. All of this happens in a two month period. One day, a customer, an older gentleman who's in his mid 60s and around six foot six. He's become a regular customer in the last few days and comes up to me while I'm at the register 
and is making a purchase while holding a coffee. Jokingly, I ask where my coffee was, and he proceeds to order me a coffee. I decline it several times with, oh, no, I was joking. Thank you, though, and go about my day. Over the next few days, I'm noticing this guy more often, and I'm doing quite a few checkouts for him. There is small talk, as most customer service agents have with regulars, but he starts to mention highly personal details about me that I have never brought up in conversation, as I don't discuss my personal life with customers, unless it's relevant to the conversation at hand. These comments include my route to work, what kind of car I drive, and the stickers that are on the back of my car, the college I went to, the apartment complex I live in, and what kind of decorations I have outside my front door. The first few times these tidbits are brought up, I brush them off as slip-ups, or he must have overheard me saying something to someone. But then he starts asking for my phone number. I decline giving him my number, stating it's against policy. So he starts insisting I take his number and call him. Again, it is stated that this is against policy, and I add that it is against corporate policy for me to take customers' information, and that I'm not allowed to hand out my information to customers. I'm sorry. As the days progress, he starts catching me as I come out from behind the register to run over to another department in our store for something. Again, I am neither a short nor small woman and I do not physically intimidate easily. But this guy who towers over me repeatedly places himself in front of me and demands I give him my number. This happened three to four times. Each time and day, he's getting closer to my personal space, demanding my phone number and information so that he can call me. When there are times he doesn't get me as his checkout associate, he gets angry and irate, physically attempting to insert himself into my space to demand my information, and there are several times co-workers have had to remove me physically from the situations because he is causing such a scene and getting so close to me that they are worried for my safety. At this point, I'm starting to get freaked out, and I'm feeling unsafe to work in my environment. So I bring it up to a couple of my supervisors who just laugh it off and say that I'm being paranoid. My dad is getting calls from me almost daily, telling him about my encounters and what this guy said or did. So finally he says I need to go and talk to the police and see what they suggest. I do since my supervisors aren't doing anything about it and I go and talk to the police department and explain the situation and end up in tears, shaking, because it's finally hitting me that this guy is stalking and harassing me, and I feel helpless. They fill out a report, and tell me to take it to my superiors, to see if they can get pictures and information on this guy, so the police can contact him, and issue a trespass, banning him from the property. I bring the case number to my supervisors, who start to do some digging. I will repeat, my primary job is behind the scenes, in a cave, and I am rarely out on the registers during my shift. They find that in a 30-day period, I had processed over 17 transactions with this customer, and that he had been coming in four to five times a week, sometimes twice a day, to buy $10 gift cards from our store. After taking pictures of his license plate and info from work, the police were able to find out that this guy lived over an hour and a half away from the store, and he was driving almost three hours every day just to make a purchase. Then, the security footage is looked at, and my supervisors notice they have no clear image of this guy. He knew where our store security cameras were located, and pointing, so he hid his face and actual height by hunching over from the cameras. They also noticed that there were points where he would be in the store for 35 to 45 minutes at a time, just looking at the front registers waiting for me to appear, so that he could make his purchase with me. 
If he didn't get me the first time, he would come back an hour or so later, right as I was about to get off work, because he knew the generics of my schedule. With no clear picture, the store had to wait on me to see this guy and point him out to a supervisor so they could issue the verbal trespass to him. He was able to come in and continue to harass me and threaten me for my information a few times because nobody really knew what he looked like. And by the time I had called for a supervisor, he had left, or well, they didn't know enough about the situation to trespass him. It took another two weeks before I was able to get a supervisor to trespass him from the store. He had cornered me again and harassed me for my number, and to check him out on the register, but I was able to slip away. When the supervisor approached him saying that he was trespassed for harassing an employee, he flat out denied that it was him, and said that they were mistaken. When the police department called him telling him the boundaries of the trespass and asked him for his side of the story, he told them I was just a girl that never told him no to a date, and that it's my fault for not saying that. He insisted that he shouldn't have been banned from the store, because if I really didn't want him to bother me, I should have just told him so. I saw him around my complex for a few weeks, and after a few months, I quit retail, because I didn't feel comfortable there. I loved working there, but I would just rather never meet this guy again. This happened back when I was in high school. At the time, I worked part-time at a grocery store, and it had become a tradition for a bunch of us to all go to some sort of haunt for Halloween. The first year we went to a haunted forest, and then haunted corn maze, that began with me falling face first into a mud pile. And that was at the very beginning. And then included things like getting stuck in a shed type building, with a slew of Jason Voorhees characters, being chased by Leatherface, and other such funny things. It was fun, but anyway. It was our third year doing this. We were all headed to a haunted factory in a nearby city. And as this was before the advent of smartphones, we relied on printed directions. Because of the size of our group, we had to travel in three cars. And I was in the last car of the caravan with my co-workers, Noel and Janie. Alas, we got lost because the people at the head of the group were terrible at navigation and we ended up in a rough part of the city. At one point, we drove by a parking garage and I heard someone scream. Eventually, our car got separated from the rest of the group at a stoplight, and by the time it turned green again, we lost everyone. We drove around for a while, talking to each other on the phone and trying to find each other. I was in the back seat, talking to someone in the first car, Laura, and trying to direct my driver Noel, while Laura did the same with her husband who was driving their car. It was not going well. Eventually, I just said, Noel, just pull over somewhere and let them come find us. Now, there were a lot of places Noel could have pulled over, like a Burger King or an office building parking lot but he chose the parking lot of a shady bar. Why? I have no idea. Perhaps it was because there was a large key bank sign nearby, and that served as a good landmark for the others to find us. So we were waiting in this lot for the others, when a line of about seven cars pulled into the bar. This wasn't so surprising, because it was a Friday night, but they didn't park normally, no. They surrounded us, the front end of the cars pointing towards us, and because of their closeness, there was no space for us to drive out of there. We were trapped. For a few minutes, they just stared at us from their cars, and then they all started to walk out and come towards us in mass. There were at least 10 rough looking guys, and by that point, 
I was convinced we were about to be robbed. Get your wallet out, I told Noel and Janie. As I did the same, I didn't have much money anyway, to be honest, which worried me because I wondered what they would do if it wasn't enough. I was terrified, but was trying to keep calm, and Noel seemed genuinely not worried. But I can't believe he wasn't at least somewhat concerned, especially given his car contained both a teenager, me, and his girlfriend, Janie. As for Janie, she was so scared that she was crying. The guy I presumed to be the leader reached the first door, approaching the passenger side, where Janie and I were. He looked inside the car at us for a moment, and then he and his group all went back to their cars and parked normally. Well, I wasn't taking any chances, and very sternly ordered Noel to go to the Burger King for God's sakes. We eventually grouped up with everyone else, and made it to the factory, which was far less scarier than what we had endured. It maybe doesn't sound that scary, but it really genuinely was. I have a few theories. One, the guys got to the car and saw that we probably didn't have much to offer them, and changed their minds about mugging us. However, this seems unlikely. Two, is that they thought we were someone else until they reached the car and looked inside. Now that's definitely possible. And three, they were just messing with us. Whatever the reason, I was truly scared. And to this day, 13 years later, I regard the city with caution. When I was eight, my entire family moved from San Diego County the middle of nowhere in Colorado. After less than two years of being there, and having to put up with the ridiculous weather, my oldest brother decided he's finally had enough. He got his GED, and left his ferrets behind for us to take care of them, since they're illegal in California, and headed west to move in with a friend. Or at least he tried to. He didn't even make it five hours before his car completely died, because it couldn't handle driving through the Rockies. He was stranded in a tiny podunk town after dark, and his car got towed to a garage while the tow truck driver offered to drive him to a cheap but nice motel to spend the night, since we couldn't get to him until the next day. They passed by a Motel 6 or some other chain motel like that, but the driver said, Ugh, I wouldn't leave my dog in a place like that. There's a way nicer motel just down the road for the same price. And kept driving until they showed up at this really rundown looking place. My brother thought it looked pretty bad, but he's kind of a shy and non-confrontational person. He's also scrawny and completely unintimidating, so he didn't say anything and just thanked the guy. He couldn't see it at night, but when my mum and I got there the next day, we realised just how weird the place was. They had a big pool right smack in the middle of the parking lot, but it was drained dry, and looked like it had never been used. The entire family that owned the place, mum, dad, daughter and son, sat on plastic lawn chairs in between the pool and the building, facing the motel rooms all day long. Then we saw the inside of his room. The bathroom had a small window which isn't unusual, but it was only two feet off the ground and next to the toilet, with nothing covering it or obstructing the view of anyone using the toilet, meaning anyone outside, like the owners, could watch you doing your business. There wasn't even a spot for a toilet paper holder, so the roll just had to sit on a shelf, and the whole room looked pretty run down. My brother then quietly told us he barely got any sleep the night before, because he was so terrified. At first, we assumed it was just because he was sleeping in a strange place alone, when he was only 17, but he pointed out a door near his bed. His room was the kind where it's connected to the room next to it by a hallway only a few feet long, with a door in each room. So large families staying in adjacent rooms can keep it open 
and get between the two without having to deal with keys. He said he heard a faint noise coming from the next room to his the night before. So we opened the door to see what was going on. And there was enough of a gap underneath to see that someone was standing right on the other side of the far door. My brother watched for a few minutes, and the guy's shadow never shifted. So he got creeped out and closed his own door, making sure to lock it and went to bed. He woke up at some point to a strange sound and sat there trying to identify it for a minute before he suddenly realized it was a doorknob rattling. The guy had finally opened his own door and was trying to get into my brother's room. The sound stopped after a few minutes, but he was too scared to fall back asleep in case the guy tried again and picked the lock. And he was just telling us this story quietly, in case the guy could hear him through the walls. He never saw what he looked like, but who knows if the guy watched him while he checked into the room or something. I have no idea what he was planning on doing to my brother, but I'm sure it wasn't good. Add this to the strange, frustrating conversation my mum had with the owner of the hotel over the phone on the drive up, and the weird ass mechanic shop the car was towed to, and the town became one of the creepiest places we'd ever had the misfortune of stopping in. It would have cost more to fix the car than it was actually worth, so we just abandoned it, and my brother had to come home again which he was actually happy to do after such a freaky experience. This happened when I was 11. It was Halloween night, and to make things even better, this year it fell on a Friday. I was trick or treating with a friend of mine, Jane, and both her and her mum. Jane was dressed as a birthday present, and I was Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. It was around 9pm, and Jane and I had collected a mountain of candy, to the point where our arms were beginning to hurt from carrying these heavy bags. During our trek, we came to a hill in our neighbourhood, where there aren't any houses until you get to the top. I was determined to increase my candy intake as fast as possible, so I sprinted to the top of the hill leaving Jane and our parents behind. When I reached the top, I heard my mum yell for me to wait for them, but I was impatient, but I still did what I was told. About that time, a black car pulled up next to me. I think it was either a Volvo or Honda Civic, and a guy who looked to be in his late 20s to early 30s rolled down his window and said hello. He looked like the friendly type, so I happily said hello back. He asked, Have you gotten a lot of candy tonight? Yup, and showed him my nearly overflowing bag. That's awesome. Can you come here and give me some candy? That's when I froze. My parents were the kind of people who drilled stranger danger warnings into your head. And this guy may not have looked like a creeper, but all the signs were there. At this point, I didn't really know what to do. I guess the guy saw my face because he motioned for me to come. I just want a little candy, not the whole bag. I noticed someone in the passenger side lean forward to look at me too. Both of them had creepy smiles on their faces. I contemplated whether or not I should run, but it was lucky about that time my mother came running up the hill, having seen what was going on. The guys saw her too faces turning white. I gotta go, he said, staring at my mum the whole time, and floored the car down the road. My mum ran to me and I threw my arms around her. When Jane and her mum finally caught up, we all walked back to my house. My bag of candy was eventually able to take my mind off the situation, but I occasionally look back on this nowadays, and can't help but wonder what would have happened to me if I'd have gone up to that guy's car, then goodness I was smart enough not to. When I was around 14, 
There was this guy that seemed to be around my age that used to be in my neighborhood. He didn't stay out there, but he had family that did. He was baby-faced, light-eyed, and kind of quiet, but he would talk to me. He didn't really play with us, he just kind of stood there watching us as we played. Maybe a family member told him to keep an eye out on his younger cousins. He would flirt with me from time to time, but I didn't think much of it. I think he had a crush on me. I think I might have had a crush on him at some point too as well. I remember one particular time he kissed me. It might have been more than just that one time, but I can't remember. And one of the neighborhood teenagers that was around my age and basically looked out for everyone on the block had said something to him along the lines of, what did I tell you about messing with these young girls? I just assumed he must have been around 16 and didn't think much of it. We would take walks around the block and talk. We would hang out every once in a while. Sometimes he would knock on my door or ring the doorbell for me to come outside. I think I might have even rode with him to a 7-Eleven a few times. Then I guess he either stopped coming around or I just became too old to play outside. Years passed and I did not run into him or if I did, it wasn't often. This year I was coming home and he saw me park my car. He was driving down the street and he stopped his car and got out. He kind of cornered me between the car door and my car, saying stuff like, hey, it's been a while, we should catch up. Nothing really seemed out of the ordinary, but his eyes just seemed crazy. It was like he was looking right through me. He didn't really have an expression on his face. Something just seemed off. I got this weird vibe from him. I remember asking him what his Instagram was, just in case I needed to show someone what he looked like. And he said he wasn't on there because of his job. Yeah, sure. I also knew that I was friends with his younger cousin on Instagram, so I figured I would just look at her page and see if she had any pictures of him show up. So I just went along with that and as I slowly tried to move closer to my door, I went into the house and tried to shake this vibe that I felt from him. That night, he called me and asked if I wanted to go to the beach to walk around and catch up. Before I could even give a response, he asked, do you trust me? Now, even though I trusted him before he asked, which I didn't, I'm damn sure didn't trust him now. Who just asks that out of the blue anyway? Well, that's a weird question to ask. I'll have to call you back. He immediately got mad at me for saying I wanted to get off the phone. It was kind of like a switch went off. I assured him that I was going to call him back, which I didn't, and he finally calmed down and I managed to hang up. He began texting me things like, what do you like about me? I think I responded something along the lines of, I haven't seen you in over 14 years. You might not even be the same person. He proceeds to tell me what he liked about me. I did not even know what made me ask him, but I asked him how old he was. My stomach felt like I was on a roller coaster when I read his response. He said he was 37. Now, I'm 29, which means he is eight years older than me. That meant that when I was 14, he was 22. This whole time, I thought he was only a few years older than me at most, and he was eight. That's when I started to realize that his, for lack of a better term, infatuation with me was not as innocent as I once thought. Now, throughout the years, I've had a problem with someone being outside my window. On one particular night about four years ago, my ex-boyfriend was drunk and mad that I wouldn't come outside to talk to him. He was outside my window trying to get me to go out. Then all of a sudden I heard two voices outside. Shortly after that, I heard my then boyfriend tell me to come outside, but it sounded like he sober up in an instant. I told him no, and he told me that it was serious. When I finally went out, 
He told me that a guy was cutting through my neighbor's yard to hop my fence into my backyard. But because it was dark, he didn't see my then boyfriend until he was closer to him. My then boyfriend said something along the lines of, Uh, what are you doing? And the guy started to stumble over his words, saying he was just cutting through to get to the other side of the block. But he turned around and went back in the direction he came. So I just explained that because I don't even know what connected the two incidents in my mind. But I went to his account Instagram page and found a picture of him and texted it to my ex before I could even explain why I was sending him the picture. And without me even saying anything, he replied, that's the guy that tried to get into your backyard. My stomach sunk so far into my ass, I thought I'd never eat again. Then he said, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I remember his eyes. I never saw him again after this whole do you trust me thing, but I shudder to think that even though we weren't in contact all these years, that he might have been outside my window on different occasions. So creepy guy that I thought was my friend, that ended up being a lot older than I thought, let's not meet again. When I was about 11 or 12, I was getting candy with friends on Halloween. It started getting pretty late, so we all decided to split up and go home. I was going down this one street that was really dark, and this dude comes out of his house as I was passing by, and I heard, Hey, I could use your help. I'm usually always willing to help, and I didn't stop to think that maybe it isn't such a great idea to stop and help a complete random stranger in the dark. So I stopped and waited for him to approach me. And he came pretty close to me and said, Can you please get in my car and start it for me while I look at the engine? And he had this very strange look on his face. I ended up getting really bad vibes and said, I, uh, I really got to get home. I could barely finish my sentence before he said, Oh, it's okay. You don't have to go home. I'm a nice guy and just need some help. Please. Get in my car and help me. I'll give you a lot of candy for your help. I started backing away, and every time I stepped back, he stepped closer. My heart was racing. He didn't necessarily do anything bad at all, but it was just the way he was talking to me, and approaching me, and standing too close for comfort. I ended up just saying, I really have to go home, I'm sorry, and began walking away really fast. And when I turned onto the next block, I ran very quickly. I still think about it all the time, because I'm not totally sure what his actual intentions were. Perhaps he genuinely needed help, but I had a feeling all over my body to just run. This happened two years ago, when I had just finished high school. I was 18 at the time, and I was not the most popular girl in my school. However, I did not go completely unnoticed. I'm mentioning this to you because I'm attractive as a female, and I do work out occasionally. I'm half Hispanic, half Caucasian, have light fair skin and dark black hair. I'm only telling you this so that you have an idea of what I look like. The thing is, I didn't have any friends. I have trust issues, which is a story for another time. I wasn't that close to my family either. So most of my social life and interactions were online. In my social life, I communicated with mostly cute guys in my city. Preferably, I only talked to younger guys, and if they were not in my city, I didn't reply because I didn't have a car. This also means that when I would go out on dates, these guys would have to pick me up. Most of my dates were nothing serious. It was mostly fun and games, but I did eventually want a relationship. 
Eventually, I came upon this Facebook message from this guy with a simple greeting. Hi, how are you? He seemed completely normal. He was not the most attractive guy that I would normally go out with. But something about him caught my attention. And I couldn't really describe it. You know that feeling when they might feel like they're the one, even if you've never met them. I do believe that I was destined at one point to cross paths with my potential soulmate. So I decided to give this guy a shot. His name was Tyler. And looking at his Facebook profile, he was pretty slender but fit. He had fair white freckled skin. And his hair was ginger, which I also really liked about him. I had a thing for gingers. After reviewing his profile, which I'm sure everyone does before replying to someone they don't know, I decided to respond to Tyler and get to know him a little more. We eventually got into a conversation and we shared some similarities. After a week of conversation, we both decided it was time to meet in person. I was not conflicted about meeting Tyler in person because I had nothing else going on. I was not working yet. And I had just finished high school. So I had a lot of free time on my hands. The day we decided to meet came around. And Tyler already knew about my situation of not having a car. So he had planned on picking me up. And I decided to wear a cute short black dress with a sweater over it because it was slightly chilly outside. And I kept my long black hair straight, and wore a little makeup. Sooner than later, the time Tyler was supposed to pick me up was here. It was around 9pm, which was the time we agreed he'd come to get me. But Tyler wasn't outside my house yet. He told me that he would be driving a black minivan but I didn't see any black cars outside my house. It was getting late. An hour had passed. And Tyler didn't respond to any of my messages, though I could see they were all read. I was about to call it off when I got a notification from my phone. Tyler said he was finally here. I was annoyed of how long he took to arrive. However, my excitement was stronger. So I decided to put my shoes on and head out. Tyler was outside the car and greeted me. I looked at him and I noticed he was underdressed than I was. He wore an orange hoodie and sweatpants and I felt a bit embarrassed and thought I should have wore something more comfortable. I walk over to hug him and he opened the door for me. Before I went inside though, I noticed that there were two people inside the car. There was a guy in the driver's seat and a female in the passenger seat. Alarms were going off in my head right away. But before I could do anything, Tyler escorted me in the car. Tyler then joins me in the back seat. And I was frightened to say the least. But I didn't know what this was yet. And Tyler never mentioned there would be people joining us. From the moment I got in, I wanted to leave. I noticed Tyler's appearance to be a bit older than he would looked on Facebook. He was still attractive but looked tired, like he hadn't slept in a while. He never spoke one word to me inside the car either, which made me feel uneasy. All he did was wink at me several times on the ride, wherever we were going. We eventually pulled up to a motel. And I had an idea where this was going but wasn't sure yet. Everyone got out the car, and I was the last to leave. The others started to make their way to the motel. And Tyler grabbed my hand and made our way behind them. When we got inside the motel room, I noticed right away a girl passed out on the bed. I knew she was just sleeping though. Everyone got settled into the room. And I did my best to play along because I did not want to give off a vibe that alarmed everyone that would be trouble. As soon as a conversation was going, I found out that the girl from the passenger seat was Tyler's sister. She had glasses and was slightly overweight. 
and she looked a bit like Tyler. She also hadn't slept in days. Her name was Shelby. And I think the guy driving was the boyfriend of the girl asleep on the bed, as he was trying to tell us to be quiet. Tyler was still looking at me with these predatory eyes, like he hadn't been with a woman in a while. And Shelby was talking with the other guy who I didn't know the name of yet. It was not soon after that I realized I was in trouble. I saw drugs being taken out of a bag that they had on them, with more drugs hidden around the motel room. I knew it would be more difficult to get out of this situation now, but I had to keep a brave face on because if I showed any signs of weakness, I'd be done for. Throughout this entire time being here, which felt like hours, Tyler eventually looked away from me to take out this glass pipe and a lighter. I could only describe this substance he was smoking to be meth. I'd never done drugs before, so I was frightened by the sight but kept a cool face. I was quiet the entire time. And then the other guy caught on because he asked Tyler why I was so quiet. Tyler shrugged, and then asked me the dreaded question. Would you like to smoke this, babe? I didn't know how to respond to that. I was shocked and scared. My mind began racing with so many thoughts. It took me a few short seconds to say, yeah, sure, thanks, babe. I decided to play this out as smartly as I could. I thought if I played along, I could sneak out somehow while everyone was caught off guard. Besides, in a situation like this, you have to think on your feet and be smart. If I'd have said no, I can imagine different scenarios of me not making it through the night. So playing this out, I waited for Tyler to finish smoking the pipe until it was my turn. After watching him for a few seconds, it was my turn. Tyler passed me the pipe. I hesitantly lit it and began to inhale the smoke. I wasn't sure if I did it right, but didn't care. I must not have smoked enough though, because Tyler continually persisted me to take longer breaths. He walked over towards me and held the pipe for me so I could try it again. I coughed the first several times and the others looked at me. They must have noticed that it was my first time doing this, but I hoped that they would think it had been a while for me. Tyler took the pipe after I was done so that he could continue. And it wasn't soon after that I began to feel lightheaded. I was starting to feel symptoms I'd never experienced before. My heart began racing faster and my vision began to widen as I could now notice little details in the room that I couldn't before. I had butterflies in my stomach, but not the bad kind. I meant the really good kind when you're experiencing your first kiss and the fireworks. I felt amazing and that scared me. I wanted to leave then, but I had to keep my composure. It was really hard now because they enhanced my fear and paranoia. Sitting the entire time there didn't make the situation any easier. Tyler then said to me, Hey babe, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I just have to use the bathroom. I didn't really have to use it. I just had to move around. I didn't know if it would have been what I had taken or myself or both. Tyler walked me over and led me to the bathroom at the end of the room, which was next to the door outside the motel. I thanked him and walked in and attempted to lock the bathroom by first instinct, but there was no lock. I panicked a little and tried to think a way out of this little motel room. Suddenly, an idea. I could fake a phone call from someone I knew off my Facebook Messenger and see who was online. Maybe they could pick me up and get me out of here. It was the best idea in my head, so I went along with it and proceeded to pester anyone I knew who I thought could take me home. I asked several guys who seemed nice enough with the same message, explaining a short version of the situation. Most of them responded with, call 911. Some didn't answer. Luckily though, a very sweet guy responded to me asking for my location. I didn't hesitate and sent him my location straight away. His name was Kyle 
and he looked around the same age as me so I felt safe. After sending him my location, he sent me a message saying that he'd be there in five minutes. I was very happy that he wasn't that far, and I replied to his message saying thank you. I wasn't sure if I knew Kyle personally, but he did seem familiar. All I know is I had to find someone in my city on my Facebook friends list who was online and could somehow take me away from these junkies. And I did. So that was taken care of. Now all I had to do was find a way to explain to Tyler why I had to leave. I flushed the bathroom toilet and even though I didn't use it, I washed my hands. I exited and noticed Shelby and the guy leaving the room. I saw Tyler continue to smoke the glass pipe, walked over to him and took the time to think of a reason to tell him why I had to leave as he continued smoking. Thinking fast on my feet, I thought of stupid explanations to escape. After he finished his pipe, he looked at me and said, feeling all better, baby. You took a while, so I got worried. My sister and Vince went to grab snacks for us, so they left really quick to the gas station. I replied back saying, Sorry about that, just been having lady problems. And is that the guy's name, Vince? Yeah, that's Vince. He's stolen from us before, so we're hanging out with him, pretending to like him. I hesitantly replied, asking, Oh, what did he steal from you? He stole my sister's car and never returned it. So we're keeping him real close. You know what I'm saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I chuckled to Tyler softly, pretending to agree with him. I then had a bright idea to make an excuse to leave. Hey Tyler, I have to check on my big brother. He said he'd be picking me up tonight and I have to see when he's coming to get me. He looked annoyed when I told him this, but I didn't care. I went on my phone and tried to call Kyle, who I messaged earlier, and he picked up after the first ring and told me he was there. I told him I'd be two minutes. I walked back over to Tyler, made an excuse how he's earlier than expected, and why I had to go. He stood up, glass pipe in hand, and told me that I wasn't leaving. I felt sick. As he said that, I wanted to throw up. I kept my composure, however, because I didn't think he would hurt me with someone else in the room, even if that person was a petite and passed out. I firmly told him, okay, let me run downstairs to the parking lot and tell him that I'm fine staying with you tonight. I grabbed his hand as I said this in the hopes that he would believe the lie. He looked conflicted about what I was saying, but agreed to let me walk outside to my fake brother Kyle from Facebook who was saving me. Tyler watched me walk outside the motel room and I could feel his eyes piercing behind my back. Even though I couldn't see him, I definitely felt it. I glanced behind me when I was going down the stairs to the parking lot to see if I was being followed. Fortunately, he wasn't. So I took that opportunity and dashed to find Carl's car. I didn't care if he heard me running to the parking lot in front of the motel as fast as I could. But then I panicked. I never asked Kyle which kind of car he drove. So I looked at every car until I saw anyone with their lights on. I then saw a car drive up to me, stop and roll down their window. It was Kyle. He opened the passenger seat and I immediately got inside. He looked worried, but I told him to just drive out of there. And he agreed. He seemed spooked by my reaction and I didn't seem to like the area I was in either. So he drove out of there in a flash. But with my adrenaline acting like crazy, and paranoia from what I'd been taking, I kept glancing behind me making sure we weren't being followed. But Kyle assured me we were safe. Eventually I felt safe enough, and told Kyle everything. He looked shocked by my responses, and he told me he was glad he could help me out. I told him again how grateful I was that he was there to pick me up, and he explained to me that he was glad to help a lady out if someone needed it. It was then that I found out Kyle wasn't just a stranger, but he was a date that I'd went out on a while ago from the Plenty of Fish dating app. 
Kyle was also a soldier who lived on a base in my area, and that made me feel safe. Once he arrived at my home, he told me to be careful with who I met up with. I hugged him, thanked him, and blocked Tyler on Facebook. I wasn't worried about Tyler knowing where I lived, because at the time a sheriff lived across from me, and Tyler knew about it too, because when he came to pick me up earlier that night, he looked around the neighborhood to see a sheriff's car across from my house. But the sheriff's car's lights weren't on of course, which is why Tyler probably didn't get spooked right off the bat. But he did ask me earlier that night, if I was the sheriff's daughter, later on in the motel room. Only now do I wish I'd had said yes. I was always cautious from time to time living in my neighborhood, because he did know my address, and it wasn't until I moved that I felt safe again. To this day, I'm always careful of who I meet up with and where I'm going. And to Tyler and his junky pals, get help, and let's not meet again. This encounter took place around 10 years ago, when I was 15 years old. I grew up in a place called Klondalkin, a small town outside of Dublin, Ireland. The town is very old. It had started as an old monasteric settlement in the 6th or 7th century, and to this day still contains remnants of old buildings and infrastructures from that era. There's a huge park in the outskirts of town, which was frequented by many people daily due to its wide range of recreational facilities, such as fishing ponds, baseball fields and playgrounds. It really is a beautiful park, and I'd spent many memorable summers and weekends just hanging out around there with friends. Like most old towns, however, Klondalkin was not without its urban legends. One such legend was about a section of the park known as the Devil's Passage. This legend stated that there was a particular location in the park that contained a cursed tree, and featured a lot of satanic worship. I won't go into too much detail about the legend, but you can read it online I'm sure. The origins of the legend are questionable at best, but having visited the supposed location, I can see exactly why such mystery surrounds the place. The Devil's Passage is partially enclosed by massive stone walls, creating a kind of courtyard feature, probably the remains of an old building. The last time I visited the location, it contained a large digger and piles of dirt, like it was undergoing some sort of construction. At the back wall of the enclosure, there was a small grove of trees that contained the alleged cursed tree. In reality, this tree was pretty weird looking. It appeared to be floating. The bottom of the tree was cut off, yet it was entwined amongst the branches of adjacent trees. Even though I always knew it was obviously not haunted or cursed, it still gave me the creeps regardless. Anyway, on Halloween of 2006, my two friends and I thought it would be fun to spend the night at the Devil's Passage, and we were very much into the paranormal, and we could think of no better place to spend Halloween. Looking back, it was a pretty stupid idea, as it was such a secluded area in such a large park at night, when the whole city was out getting drunk and partying. After telling our parents we were going trick or treating, we headed to the park at 6pm, set up our spot at the very back of the grove within the Devil's Passage, next to some boulders, which we used as seats, and lit a fire with some old newspaper we found in sticks. Looking around at all the empty beer bottles, burnt wood and graffiti, it was clear that this place was a hot spot for underage drinking and debauchery. Thankfully, we were the only ones here on this particular night. Well, at least for the first few hours. After a short while spent sipping on beers, 
that my friend had managed to steal from his dad and puffing on cigarettes, we were visited by a middle aged man. All of us panicked and began stamping out the small fire we had going. As the man approached, we could see he was wearing a formal black suit with white gloves. This man clearly wasn't the park ranger trying to kick us out. He was a middle aged man with grey hair and a goatee. We yelled hello over to him to see what he wanted. He just smiled and kept walking towards us. He told us not to worry and that we weren't in any trouble. We asked him who he was and what he wanted from us. He then said he was throwing a bit of a party at the location tonight and asked if we would like to stay for it. At first, my friends and I looked at each other with some sort of disbelief. Was he joking? This guy certainly didn't look like the partying type, especially not the type to host a party in a park on Halloween night. We told him it was probably best if we just head off and that we were sorry to intrude on his spot. He kept insisting that we stay and he could offer us free booze and drugs. He even told us that there'd be girls coming and they would love to meet us, if you know what I mean. While his proposal began to entice my two friends, I was now starting to freak out. Why didn't my friends think it was weird for a middle aged man inviting a bunch of 15 year olds to a party in the woods? After a few minutes of him trying to convince us to stay, it all became way too intense for me and I interrupted him saying we had to go. My friends looked at me puzzled. We might as well stay for a few more drinks. It's not even nine yet. I reluctantly agreed, but told them I'd be leaving at 10 with or without them. The more time we spent there, the more unsettled I felt. The man who called himself Stuart started asking us really weird personal questions, like if we were virgins or if we'd ever consider doing it with another guy, even if we'd be willing to participate in an orgy. There was something clearly wrong with this guy. He seemed normal at first, but the more he spoke, the more he revealed himself to be absolutely insane. I don't know what this guy was doing here, but he definitely wanted for us to stay for some kind of dodgy reason. He kept telling us that the other party goers would be coming very shortly and with plenty of alcohol and drugs, but no one ever arrived. It was as if he was stalling and trying to keep us there for as long as possible. Eventually I grew tired of waiting around and wasting time with this creepy old git. I told my friends that I was leaving and that I'd see them later. As I began to walk away, Stuart became anxious. He practically begged me to stick around. At first he was polite, playful even, joking about how I was letting my friends down and that I would regret it if I didn't stay. When I refused again stubbornly, the threats started to come. My heart sank. He told me that he would kick the crap out of me if I tried to leave. His manner quickly changed from being friendly to downright aggressive. My friends finally started to back me up. They told the man that if he was going to be a dickhead, they were also leaving. That's when he took out a knife from inside his suit jacket and began brandishing it and saying that nobody was going anywhere. With a sudden surge of adrenaline, I picked up a big log from off the ground and whacked him across the head with it. I screamed at the top of my lungs for him to get the hell away from us and dragged my friends by the arm and started running as fast as I could out of there. He chased after a while, screaming about how his friends would intercept us on the way out and they'd catch us. He eventually gave up his pursuit and we escaped unharmed. To this day, I don't know who the guy was or what his motives were. So creepy suited guy in the park? Let's never meet again. Just about 20 minutes ago, this happened to me. 
I'm running express checkouts and playing Pokemon Go. So I'm walking kind of slow through the hotel. I had a lot of notes about disruptive rooms. So I was trying to stay quiet to listen in order to hear people being rowdy. I'm rounding the corner on the second floor and see an older man dressed in black pants, shoes, long sleeve shirt, and seemed to be elderly. But I only saw his white hair from the back. He was walking in the opposite direction towards the staircase at the end of the hall really slowly, which led me to believe he was even more elderly than I thought. I really didn't want to talk to him because it's 2.30 in the morning and it's quiet hours. So I slowed my pace a little bit. I only had one more room to give the express checkout. So I got down near the end of the hall and slipped it under the door. I was close enough that I could see into the stairwell. So both up and down the staircases. I was about three doors down, not far at all. And I noticed him standing just outside the doorway. As I got closer, he started moving to go upstairs. So I figured he heard me or saw me and was also feeling antisocial. I was going downstairs, so no harm in walking at normal speed. I got to the last section of the doors and he's walking very slowly up the stairs. He was only on the fourth or fifth step and I get closer to the door to the stairwell and then it slams shut. I jump because not only was it loud and unexpected, but also our doors have the thing on top that slows it down so it doesn't slam. My reflexes kicked in. I rushed to open the door and see what's going on with about five to 10 seconds max between all of this happening. I open the door and the man is nowhere to be found. I look up the staircase and there wasn't a guy in sight. I got to the first landing to investigate more and I see the guy turn the corner at the opposite end of the hall, a good 40 to 50 yards at the other end. There's no human way possible for someone to get to the bottom of the staircase on the second floor, all the way to the opposite end of the hall on the next floor up in the few seconds it took me to see him. Even if it wasn't an elderly man, it's still impossible. And I would have heard footsteps if he were running. He even turned the corner still walking very slowly. My hair is standing on end. I just hope for the sake of the guests that he's not some evil spirit or something freaked me right out. This one Halloween night in 2010, I just remember that I was older and participated in scaring the hell out of these kids. My dad is a huge Halloween freak. Every year we decorated the front porch like mad. Basically, it looked like a Halloween store puked in our yard. We had people hide in the bushes and ambush kids, that kind of thing too. And after the night was done, my dad and I would unplug everything and take things that could be stolen inside. We had this one Halloween prop that sat on a table on the front porch next to our laughing skull. It was a pretty decently sized seance ball with an old hag head in it. It was motion activated. No big deal, right? So of course it starts making the creepy noise and old hag starts talking when we walk by it to unplug it. We unplug it and it abruptly shuts off when we take it inside. We take down more stuff. And as I was right behind my dad, he walked by the seance head and like magic, it starts making the creepy noise and talking again. Now this thing is unplugged. The plug is off to the side of the ball with no outlet around. So no, it was not powered and it wasn't battery operated. I seriously thought my dad was messing with me, but he looked just as confused as I was. When he bent down to check it out, it once again abruptly stopped. He picked it up just to see if the off switch was set. And it was. Is it possible for leftover power to turn things back on even when it's been unplugged for a while? 
I know that batteries can cause this, but this was an electrically powered unit by a plug. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for this. Isn't there? I am not a social person, especially to family. And I'm a little estranged with my mother, despite the fact I still live with her. And I still love and care for her. I wanted to get her something as it was Mother's Day, and told her I was going out and would be back in time for dinner. She told me that she didn't want me to leave, and that it was too dangerous right now. You see, my mum can get paranoid and worried easily. So I shrugged it off and told her I wanted to walk to the store anyway. Rite Aid is very convenient for most things, and I like going there. Plus, the one I go to has an ATM, and I can get there in 10 to 15 minutes at walking distance from my house. I walked into the Rite Aid, and I had to wait for an employee so I can select perfume for my mum. Waiting there, a creep walks straight towards me, asking me if I know where the towels were. It was a simple, normal question. I told him I didn't know, but pointed out where I thought the towels would have been. Then he stood there looking at me briefly until the employee showed up to unlock the perfume. The creep left. I didn't really think much about it at the time because I was killing time on my phone. Like he could have asked the employee where the towels were because I'm just an unsure customer. Then again, I didn't tell him I was waiting for the employee so I told the employee I'm just gonna get a gift card, bag and stuffing paper. The creep was standing at a distance, looking at me while I was walking towards his direction. Then without stopping to talk, I just asked him, did you find the towels? And he said that he did. Then I walked past him, and that's when he started following me, asking me these questions, what my name was, what my last name was, if I lived around here and what was my address, and he thought I was very pretty, apparently, and asked as well if he could come by and visit me. All of these questions while I'm trying to avoid him, and he's still following me around the store. He didn't have at least one towel or anything. Then I started thinking about the objective, get out and go home. Then he began groaning and breathing heavily, standing behind me, and then he walked away and left the store. Whatever, I was kind of confused, but I didn't want to know what he was doing behind me. I still just don't know what to think about it. I told the employee what happened, and all he had to say was, I know, I saw. And then I asked if he's still out there. He vanished. So I called my cousin. She picked me up and I had told her what happened. We went to our grandmother's house first because I wanted to visit her also for Mother's Day. I looked out the window and I saw a car sitting out there in the middle of the street. Then it drove away. I thought I was being paranoid until the second encounter. Now. Before I mention this, there's a speculation of mine that he's probably been to my house. My grandma is neighboured behind my house and we both live in the first row, so there's a possibility he could have been parked somewhere nearby. Because back in August, I was checking if everything was locked up and I heard breathing. There's a joke between my mum and me that either the garage is haunted or there's someone in the house and I asked her if her boyfriend was sleeping in the garage, and she told me he was not. So at this point, we kind of searched the house, and our house is pretty small, so there's nowhere to hide. We didn't bother to check the backyard, and I was standing at the sliding door when I heard breathing, but I was still standing near the garage too. It's scary because I'll never know if it was him, or if it was all in my head. But my mum also heard something that night too. Now, could it be possible? It could have been him. My second encounter happened just after Christmas. 
I got back in touch with a friend and we had been talking and I decided to call him on my walk to Rite Aid. It's been a while and I mean I've been taking walks and thought the creeper had been long gone, but I still kept my guard up in case of other creepers too. Anyway, I told my friend I'd talk to him when I get back home. I look to my right because I see a car driving at my walking pace and it was the right aid creeper at eye level. He gave me eye contact with an ominous grin slash smile on his face with his tinted windows being sealed shut. Then it's like he knew. So he drove straight into the parking lot right near Rite Aid. He didn't stop me. I got what I needed and exited. His car parked right behind me. So I ran straight into the grocery store next to Rite Aid and stayed there until I saw his car drive out and blended to the streets. I just walked home, pretended like the second encounter never happened. What would he have done if I hadn't have caught him in the act? Has he been stalking me? I'm not going to shelter myself at home in fear. There's no way. So right aid creeper, let's not meet a third time. I live in a seaside town in Southern Australia, one that has been settled by Europeans for over a hundred years. There are plenty of alleged haunted places here and there, and I have seen and felt a few things myself. The scariest thing that happened to me was when I went to a hotel. It's been investigated by paranormal groups, and there is even a book about haunted places around Southern Australia in which the hotel features. There is the story that a little girl was killed, run over by a horse and cart in the late 19th century. There's also the story of the young boy who ended his own life because of his cruel parents. And I believe I experienced the presence of this boy. I'd felt some spirits in that place and I was pretty certain I could sense the boy. Anyway, I went home without thinking too much about it, but later on is when it became interesting. That night, I got up late to use the bathroom. There was soft moonlight shining through the glass sliding door on my way in. And my way back from the lavatory to the bedroom, I saw a figure standing in the room. It looked as solid as a living person, but had its back to me. It was the form of a young boy, and I immediately knew what I was looking at and was both shocked and surprised. I was extremely scared and worried. I chose to be a coward, to rush past the figure and pretended I never noticed it. I quickly did what most people do and hid under my covers. I had never seen a spirit look so realistic or so solid before. There is also a less frightening experience I had in a local tattoo studio. This building was once a bank some years ago, and the building is over a hundred years old. There was some other business in it prior to the studio moving there, but I don't recall what it was. One day while getting a tattoo myself, I was talking to the tattoo artist when I heard a female voice except there were no other females there at the time. I also felt a decidedly feminine energy, and I asked the tattooist if the building had a spirit in it, and if it was a female. He confirmed to both questions, and next, I felt someone brush the top of my head as I was having my tattoo done. I thought my nine-year-old son had touched my head, as he was there waiting for me to take him out to the playground instead of spending several hours watching me get a tattoo. Turns out no one had touched me. That's when I knew it had to have been the female spirit. These were not the first times I have been touched by a spirit, or heard one or saw one. Until 1997 I had no idea a spirit had the ability to physically touch someone, until it happened to me. I love going to old places with history. You just have to be careful sometimes. You never know when a spirit might decide to follow you home. For context, 
I am 21 now. When I was 12, my family had just moved from the Midwest to a town in South Georgia. I was a four foot six, 85 pound, tiny homeschooled girl that had always grown up in suburbia and was now thrust into a small town with rampant crime and very heavy gang activity. My dad was deployed to Iraq at this time. So on Halloween night, there was no adult to take my brothers and I trick or treating because mom was staying at the house to hand out candy. My older brother decided to stay home because he was 14 and too old to trick or treat. Well, growing up in a mostly organic and sugar free household, I sure as hell wasn't gonna let that stop me from getting my annual sugar binge. And so I set out with my eight year old brother to trick or treat in our neighborhood. It was a very small neighborhood, well lit by streetlights and full of people walking around. So my mom was fine with us going and told us to be back soon. We started making our rounds. I was dressed as a chef and my little brother was wearing a fluffy lion costume like the one in the Wizard of Oz. We went down our street and the one next to it, and then turned to walk down the way that would take us in a circle back to the house. Then something felt off all of a sudden. The street lights were all out on this street, and I started feeling uneasy. It was so still and quiet and none of the houses had their porch lights on. And there were no people trick or treating, which is strange, considering it was only 830pm. I kept walking tentatively, my little brother just bouncing along happily beside me with his bag of candy. In the dark, I'm suddenly able to make out a tall figure about 15 feet down the street sitting on one of those metal cubes that hold electric stuff that all our neighborhoods seem to have. He was sitting extremely still, not looking at us, but staring straight ahead of him, looking like he was trying not to move. He was wearing a black hoodie, with the hood pulled up and cinched tight around his face. Well, my big sister instincts kicked in, and I just grabbed my brother's hand slowed down my steps and tried to inconspicuously say, John, slowly turn around and start walking that other way, but don't say anything. Being the loud kid he always had been, he said, what? In a piercingly loud baby voice. I just said, turn around through clenched teeth and then pull him by his hand and started to walk back down the direction we came in as casually as I could. All of a sudden, the figure jumps up and starts sprinting at us yelling angrily. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something to the effect of you little twats get back here. We ran for our lives. And I still don't know if I ever have run so fast. My heart was racing and my little brother was lagging behind, and I could still see and hear the man running after us. We booked it around the corner to the first house we saw, and burst into the garage, where a nice old man was handing out candy. We clearly startled him. He looked like a nice old grandpa, and I started blurting out what had just happened very loudly and maniacally. He calmed us down, and offered to walk us back over to our house. Before we left, two kids who were sitting in the garage with him walked over to us. They were about our age, and I assume were his grandchildren. They handed us their pillowcases full of candy and told us to take them because they already had a lot and we needed it more than them because we weren't going to trick or treat anymore. To this day, it was one of the most striking and generous unprovoked acts of kindness by children I have ever experienced. I said thank you, and the friendly grandpa walked us home and told our mum what happened. She thanked him profusely, and gave him a hug, and we went inside to eat candy safe and sound. I'm really grateful for that old man, 
and his family. This happened in early 2017. I was a 23 year old girl and had just finished college. The field I studied was not huge in my area. So I knew I had to leave it. And I moved to the biggest city in my country in order to pursue a post grad course and look for a job. As I was still unemployed, I thought I would wait to make a long term rental contract, worrying about a bad commute to work. In the first few months, I was switching between Airbnbs and hostels all the time. I was tired of this and decided this would be my last move. And then with or without a job, I would settle. I was already running out of money and decided to stay in a dorm in a hostel next to where I was taking classes. Sharing a bedroom is not a problem with me during a trip. But when you're living somewhere trying to create a routine and have some privacy, sharing a bathroom with complete strangers just sucks. I would share the dorm with three guys. But it's not with any of them my bad encounter was. They were nice, apart from them snoring badly at night. In another dorm, however, was the creepiest person I'd ever met. He was in his mid 30s and not traveling. He was a native from the city we were in and was using the hostel as a new house since his parents kicked him out of theirs. He introduced himself and tried to be nice and flirty. I was polite, but declined his interest. He wouldn't stop. He started following me all day long inside the hostel. Anywhere I went, he would show up in less than five minutes. On my second day there, I left the hostel to a job interview. And by the time I arrived late into the night, he was sitting alone in the front stair waiting for me. He told me I was the most beautiful thing on earth, and that he would buy me snacks, ask me out and try to get information about my personal life. All the while, I had made it very clear that I wasn't interested. This happened in three days. I was already exhausted of his presence. But what I didn't know is that it would get worse. As soon as one of the guys that were sharing the dorm with me left, he asked hostel staff to switch dorms and stay in the same as me. Obviously, he never told me. So imagine how surprised and disgusted I was when I saw him coming to the dorm with all his belongings. I was so afraid of his presence that I kept sleeping with jeans on to avoid any sort of terrible situation. The very next morning, I knew I had to go. The situation had exponentially gone worse, and I couldn't handle it anymore. While I was packing, this guy showed up, noticed what I was doing and started to cry, asking me not to leave him. Then to make things more creepy and disgusting, he told me he would miss seeing my face when I was asleep, and that he would have to take photos. I was trying my best to be chill about this, but I lost it when he told me he had taken pictures of me sleeping. I took his phone out of his hand and asked to see the pictures and delete them all. There was a bunch of me sleeping in the night before, and I left the hostel and really regretted not reporting him to the staff. I hope to never meet this creep again. I was 14 at the time and was and still am awkward. I like to avoid confrontation. So I say as little as possible to offend someone to make them upset with me. At the time, I was at a stupid Halloween party that was basically for adults and young six to 10 year old kids. So I was extremely bored. And my mum said I was too old to trick or treat. So I just walked along with the group of adults and young kids in my costume. At one point, this 16 year old guy was introducing me as being the oldest children of one of my mums in the group. You could tell by the way he talked and acted that there was something off with him. But I thought it was great that there was someone closer to my age. So I ignored it. 
My mum suggested we split off from the group to hang out, as she's a very lenient parent. And I had a phone, so I agreed. Him and I were walking around the neighbourhood, as he went door to door awkwardly asking for candy. As I stood on the sidewalk, as I couldn't ask. At one point during the night, I noticed something was really off with him. He started asking me if I believed in vampires. I said yes, because I was worried what his reaction would be if I said no. His eyes lit up, and he started talking about him being a vampire and asked if I wanted to go back to his house so that he could bite and suck on my neck. I nervously laughed and said, Oh no, I'm sorry. I have a boyfriend. And he wouldn't be comfortable with that. He replied with, Oh, I have a girlfriend, but she wouldn't mind. It's just sucking your neck because my fangs get sore when I don't. Just come over. I knew he lived in the neighborhood because everyone in the group did other than my family, so I didn't know how to say no. I kept politely declining as the sun was almost completely down, so it was getting dark, and I was getting scared from his persistence and being alone with him. So I started blowing up my mum's phone with calls and trying not to cry. She wasn't answering. So we wandered along the huge neighborhood and by the grace of God ran into the original group. I ran to my mum and hugged her for a while, crying and being mad at her for not answering because she left her phone at the house. It may not sound that creepy, but this guy was so persistent and basically begging me to let him suck my neck when I was alone with him. I regularly go thrift shopping in my small town in Ontario, Canada. About three weeks ago, I went to the Salvation Army to pick up some vintage finds. I sometimes go into the housewares and art section to see if there's anything worth picking up to resell. And that is when I saw it. I had always been interested in creepy, unsettling and dark things. And this painting immediately caught my attention. It was as if it were begging me to take it home. I was overwhelmed by the sense of urgency. I needed this painting now for whatever reason. The more I looked at it, the more I discovered new details. It's not a particularly nice painting. It has a very unrefined feel to it, but it was not the style that drew me in. It was the subject matter. It was so odd. I ended up adding the painting to my cart and continued to shop around. The painting ended up costing me only $2, which I considered a deal, since it came in a very nice old frame. I had it in my room for a few days before I noticed strange things happening. I live alone in an apartment, and it's generally quiet and peaceful. This all changed by the third day that I owned the painting. At first, harmless things were happening, and I thought nothing of them. Instances included cupboards opening, things falling, lights flickering. I just attributed the cupboards opening to me being forgetful. Things falling as me not properly putting things back, or the light bulbs as needing replacing. By the sixth day, the nightmares started happening. In my nightmares, some dark figure approaches the side of my bed from my closet. While I'm stuck in some sort of sleep paralysis, not being able to do anything while it comes towards me. It gets closer until it's at the side of my bed. It looks at me while frozen, but doesn't even have eyes. I've had this recurring dream for five or six nights since I obtained the painting all with the figure from the painting coming to visit me. After the first nightmare, I knew that these incidents had something to do with the painting. The energy coming off it was just dark, and it got darker and darker until I was so uncomfortable that I moved the painting out of my room. 
here is where things get even weirder. I decided to investigate the painting further and take it out of its frame. As soon as I took it out of the frame, this smell enveloped my house. The painting never smelled prior. It was only when I removed the glass and wood frame that the stench of sulfur came over everything. It was putrid. I immediately noticed the back of the painting, and it is terrifying. After the fifth or sixth nightmare, I moved the painting to my basement storage locker at the bottom of the apartment complex. The dreams have stopped, but the cabinets opening and stuff like that still happen. Something else started too. I sometimes woke up in the middle of the night to hearing what sounds like scratches in my front door. When I go and investigate, there's nothing there. I've asked my neighbors, but they don't hear anything. In addition to the paranormal occurrence, my health has also taken a hit since I got the painting. I've been feeling unwell, run down and depressed all the time. I tried telling people about it, but no one really believes me. The only one who has said anything that makes me feel like I'm not crazy is when my dad came over and took a look at the painting. The first words to come out of his mouth were, Damn, that's dark. The painting itself has a very odd subject matter. This is what I see. Please let me know if you see anything different. There is a dark figure sitting in a wooden chair staring into a mirror with its hand on its head, almost as if it is in shock. In the mirror, it is not the person's reflection, rather another dark figure standing in it. It almost looks like its hands are cut off, its arms are long, and there looks to be blood on the mirror. The walls are cracked and show plaster. There are also scratch marks with the same red on the mirror as on the wall. I'm wondering if this meant the person in the chair is trying to escape. There is also a box, which kind of reminds me of a Dybbuk box in the corner of the room. Possibly the most disturbing part is the upside down family portrait. I have no idea what it all means. Hopefully someone can give me some advice on how to remove the spirit from disturbing my home and my dreams. The artist is unmarked. There's no date either. If anyone has seen any similar paintings or styles, I'd love to get in touch. I want my life to go back to normal. I'm sure some of you people will probably tell me to throw it out or burn it, and I would. But I have this irrational fear that whatever spirit resides in that painting will get angrier. For the past 16 years, I've lived in a very standard house on a very average street in a big boring neighborhood. In the daytime it's quiet, there aren't very many kids anymore, just empty nesters or the elderly. However, not very many kids meant that there are still some, and so when Halloween comes around, I still go all out. The pumpkins, the fake spider webs, the blinding strobe lights, all of it. Then I sit on the bee porch, dressed as a spooky witch, and wait. Now every single year, mostly back in my trick-or-treating days, I can recall a certain strangeness. There is, without fail, a man that walks the night silently dressed as none other than Michael Myers as in the Halloween slasher Michael Myers. Pretty harmless. It is Halloween. It is scary. He never says a word, just walks silently with a long knife that glints as it catches the street lamps. This year I'm sitting in the dark on my porch. It's two hours in, and I've had a staggering total of five kids come through, and was about to give up. Behold, Michael Myers makes his appearance. 
Quietly, he walks past my house. I'm thinking, dang, my porch light is off, he won't see me. But in that moment, he stops mid stride and turns towards me and freezes. For what felt like ages, he stared at me in the dark, totally alone. Then he twitches his head and resumes his walk. The worst part is that no one else seemed to have ever noticed this guy. Neither of my two brothers, not my best friend, and no one. For 16 years, I've been the only one to see him. He's good. I'm not one to believe in paranormal or spirits. But this happened, and I don't know how to explain it. I was walking with my friend Dale trick or treating, as well as some kids that were my mum's friends kids. We were walking near a small bridge to get to an island known as Seabrook Island. It's a small neighbourhood, but high middle class, and I know the area like the back of my hand. As we're approaching the bridge, we hear one of the other kids scream. We turn around. And in an instant, the kids were gone. The decoration and the whole surrounding area had all their lights turned out. It was as if in an instant, we were warped into a different dimension. We shouted to see where the kids went. But there wasn't a soul in sight. Feeling anxious, we started running around. The neighborhood didn't look like itself. And eventually, we reached a park with a green ladder and metal slide on a concrete floor. As I mentioned, I know this area extremely well. And as far as I know, this park does not exist. We kept leaving the park. But no matter how or where we went, we always ended up winding back here. It was after a while that we realized we had our phones with us. I pulled mine out, but my contacts were blank. What the hell is going on? I punched in my mum's number manually. And right as I went to hit the call button, the phone turned off. I was getting extremely scared. There was nothing I could do. We walked around and eventually led back to the park. A man was there. And we asked him desperately to make a call on our behalf to my mother, because we were lost, scared and frightened. The man, however, gave no useful reply. He was speaking gibberish, or at least it was gibberish to me. I don't know which language it was. And when he showed me his phone screen, after painstakingly communicating with hand gestures that we needed to ring someone, I saw that his phone screen was cracked and unresponsive to the touch. So effectively useless, and it just displayed the time with a black screen. Great. We left the man and continued trying to find our way out. After what felt like forever, something happened. And I felt my phone turn on in my pocket. I looked down and it was 1201. And just like that, we suddenly recognized the neighborhood we were in. Lights were illuminating houses, and we quickly made our way back to my house. It was very late. I wondered what had happened to the other kids, but I was sure they made their way home safely. Dale went back to his house and I to my own. I threw myself into bed and passed out. In the morning, I woke up and Dale was on the floor asleep. This has been a very confusing night. I'm not sure what's caused this, but it has creeped me out beyond measure. I've had more than my fair share of creepy encounters. But this one was particularly dramatic. One where I really did feel my life was in danger. I was on holiday visiting family in South Asia. Having been born and brought up in England, a lot of things over there are quite foreign to me. We, my parents and I, 
were staying at my uncle's apartment. My aunt and uncle were at work, and my parents had gone away for a day trip to visit relatives in a neighboring town, leaving me at home with my two cousins, Hamish and Adam. Adam was eight years old at the time, and Hamish was three, and I was about 13. Adam and Hamish always argued about everything. If one wanted a particular cereal for breakfast, an argument would break out over breakfast choices. Adam is stupid for wanting Cocoa Pops, my shreddies are so much better. I'm not even gonna sit here and eat while he eats. Anyway, that sort of stuff. While playing with the toy, let's make the doll swim in the lake. No, it's not a lake, it's the sea, and so on and so forth. I was very used to them disagreeing and squabbling, and couldn't remember any time when they were in harmony, especially over playtime. This might seem like a digression, but it's relevant to this story. On this particular day, Hamish was in the living room, building a Lego boat he had been working on for a few days now. Adam had gone outside to play with his friends on the street. He'd left the door slightly ajar so that he could come and go. It was a hot and humid day as usual, so I went to take a shower and was sitting in my room drying my hair, when Hamish came running in in tears. Tashina, my boat, it's broken. What? My Lego boat, someone stepped on it and broke it. Oh. He grasped my hand and led me to the living room where the boat was snapped. He was upset. It had been his pride and joy, and so I commiserated and reassured him that not all hope was lost, and that it shouldn't take too long to fix. I thought he must have broken it himself by accident, perhaps stepping on it, and not realising he had been working on the floor with the boat sitting in the living room rug. With Hamish finally placated, and back to work on his boat, I returned to my room, and a few minutes passed without incident. I could hear Hamish moving around, and I heard Adam come back inside and go to the living room. I got a book, and curled up on the bed. It was a lazy, drowsy sort of day. And then, all of it was shattered. Adam and Hamish came charging into my room and was tripping over each other, screaming my name. Hamish ran to me, and Adam paused to slam on the bedroom door to close it behind him. There's a man in our living room. He's wearing a mask, and he had a knife. He must have been the one who broke my boat. Wait, what? I look at the pair of ashen faces completely solemn. Are you playing some sort of game? No, he's wearing a horrible scary mask, and he has a knife. If they were play acting, and if this was some sort of pretend game. Where is he? In the living room, Adam said, pointing. He's wearing a mask. Yes, like a Halloween mask with a big scary smile on it. Smile showing teeth, said Hamish, nodding along furiously. And a knife, said Adam. A big knife, said Hamish. They looked entirely serious and terrified, looking at me with their upturned, earnest and pleading faces. I think more than anything, it was the fact that they agreed upon the description of this man, and what he was carrying that really cemented upon me, that they were telling the truth. If this had been some sort of pretend game, they would have disagreed by now, trying to outdo each other in what he was wearing, or perhaps the weapon he was carrying. Instinctively, I went to the door, I wasn't sure why, or to achieve what purpose. I still wasn't scared. I knew they were telling the truth. But could there be an innocent explanation? They were overexcitable kids. My hand went to the door handle. No, said Adam in a hiss, as they both came running towards me, their hands clawing at me. Don't go there. Wait. Okay. Let me get this straight. He was in the living room. They nodded. What was he doing? How did you manage to escape? Did he threaten you? 
I was sitting on the sofa watching TV," said Adam. Hamish was on the floor with his boat. The man came in, and we saw the knife. What happened then? Was he pointing it at you? No, it was just in his hand. As soon as we saw him, we ran and came to you. The living room has two doors, one that leads to a corridor that basically snakes around the front of the building, and the other one that leads to a corridor to the inside of the apartment. The boys had taken this latter doorway with a man presumably standing by the first one. This story did indeed make sense. It had come so suddenly. And was taking me a while to actually process the seriousness of what they were telling me, that there was an intruder inside the apartment with a knife, and I was the oldest, so I was in charge. They had to come to me for protection. Oh God, what to do? Okay, let's not panic. We need to call the cops. Mobiles were still uncommon in this era. The only phone in the apartment was the landline, and luckily. It was right outside my room. It was on the table in the corridor, facing the door to my room. However, it wasn't a cordless phone, so if the cord was long enough, I might be able to grab the whole thing and pull it inside and close the door. I rehearsed it in my mind. I need to get the phone so we can call the police. No, the man will get you," said Hamish, clinging at my arm. "He might be in the corridor," said Adam. We were all slightly whispering. Well, we can check," I said, my hand going for the handle. "No!" hissed Adam, as he grabbed my hand, insisting it was dangerous. And I told them I'd just take a peek. Adam, eventually, and reluctantly agreed. I turned the handle slowly, and my stomach felt tight as I did so. The tension of the boys standing next to me didn't help the matters. When it was slightly ajar, I pressed my face into the gap and looked around. The corridor was dark and empty. Okay, I said, turning to face the boys. There's no one there. I'm gonna sneak out and grab the phone and come back. Okay. As soon as I get back in with the phone, you close the door behind me. It's only a few steps to the phone. It'll just take a few seconds. Don't worry. Adam was a mess, wringing his hands, pleading with me not to go. Hamish stood stoic, nodding, and I pulled the door open further and stepped out. Hamish and Adam crowded into the space I had just vacated, peering out the doorway to watch me. As I stepped outside into the empty, quiet corridor, I began to feel silly. Could this just be the boys' active imagination? Had they seen something on TV and become convinced it was real? Maybe I was just being stupid. Maybe there was no one there, and I was feeling much calmer and incredulous about the whole situation. Still, it was possible, but better to be safe than sorry. I would take the phone inside and call my uncle to come home. I stepped up to the table, took the phone, quickly assessing it, and tugged on the cord that plugged it into the wall. Yes. It should be long enough to take inside. I picked the whole thing up, and looked up. He was standing there, wearing a clown-like, grinning mask, knife in hand. I don't think I need to tell you it was the most stomach-dropping, terrifying moment. The shock and fright felt like something had just smacked me in the face. I couldn't scream. I dropped the phone and just leapt back to the door. Slamming it into Adam and Hamish as I did so, all three of us banged the door shut. Adam and Hamish stood leaning against the door, and I dragged my bed in an adrenaline-fueled frenzy. There was no lock on the door. Would the bed be strong and heavy enough to hold it? I began piling everything I could onto the bed to make it even heavier. Adam and Hamish wordlessly joined in. The books on the bookshelf, all my bags, my suitcase, my clothes, the clock, everything, and then we all sat down on the bed, clambering onto it, leaning against the upper part of the door to make sure it wouldn't open. Now that we're all still, we could just look at each other. Adam began to cry. He was bawling, in a thin, whiny voice. 
Oh my god, we're gonna die, he wailed. No, no, we're not gonna die, I said. Though my heart was still pounding painfully against my chest, and I felt like I was gonna be sick. Hamish was just sitting quietly next to me, his little hands folded across his chest. We're gonna die, Adam said again. I told them to calm down. I thought about what we could do. We couldn't stay here forever. We could just wait until he leaves. I don't think I'll ever forget the image. Little Hamish, three years old, sitting next to me looking solemn. His legs out in front of him, clad in those little jeans, with his hands clasped in his lap. His back leaning against the door, and Adam on the other side of me. His knees pulled up to his chest, tears streaming down his face, making whimpering noises. All of us in a row barricaded against the door, and we could hear footsteps in the corridor occasionally. The time pressed on, but our tension didn't wane. With every passing second, we expected to hear a thud on the door, and the man trying to get in. Thankfully, it didn't happen. We eventually heard my aunt come in, talking in the corridor, wondering where we were and calling us. It was amazing, but there was a tinge of dread in case the man was still in the apartment, in case he might attack her. Hastily running outside, we told her what happened and searched the place, emboldened by the presence of an adult, but there was no sight of the man. The frustrating thing was, though my uncle and aunt, when they got home from work, didn't believe us at all, she thought we were flat out lying for entertainment, which I found particularly undermining, given that at 12 years old, and mature enough for my age, I would never make something up as serious as that. First she laughed and rolled her eyes, waving us away when we persisted and repeated, insisting it did really happen and that we were telling the truth. She eventually grew tired and told us to stop. I still find it astonishing how lightly they can take the complaints of children. We were shaken up for the rest of the day, and feeling very indignant and having been just shooed away after something so terrifying had happened. When my parents got back, we told them, and it was some solace that they did indeed take us seriously. They knew that it was completely out of character for me to dream up or lie about something like that. My aunt and uncle, however, still didn't agree. Later in the evening, after we were getting ready to go out to dinner, we heard my aunt cry out in surprise, and my uncle rushed to see what happened. It turns out all of her jewellery was gone, and that was when they finally did indeed believe that we had been telling the truth, and there was an intruder. My best friend at the time, my brother, his friends, and my friend's boyfriend, all went out to our local abandoned house, which we call Witch's Circle, to go ghost hunting. Now, this little abandoned house is actually in a national park, called Little Basin Creek Reserve. But there's actually a story behind this house, which I don't know how much of it I believe. But it is said that on Halloween night in the 50s, two guys brought their girlfriends out for a sacrifice. I've gone to the archives and done tons of research, but I can't find anything to verify this information. This Halloween, when we went out there, we were the only cars out there. You have to drive past town a little ways and head out a dirt road to get there. And there's only one spot for parking so we would be able to see if others were there. As we were making our way down the trail to the house, I'm holding my best friend's hand. We start walking under a tree, while the entire time I'm staring at the house and not paying attention to my surroundings like I should be in a dark wooded area. A small branch from the tree that we're all walking under at the time falls and lands horizontally at my feet. I didn't see it happen, but my friend and brother did. They stopped me and looked before stepping over the severed branch. I should have taken it as a warning and not kept going, but I did. 
as we got further from the entrance. We all stood talking quietly amongst ourselves, and then we all heard a very high-pitched scream coming from the backyard of the house. We stopped in our tracks, and I ran back towards the car. I've never been more terrified in my life. It's a sound that I will never be able to erase from my memory. That high-pitched death scream. There's no way I can debunk this, as we were the only ones out there, and it definitely wasn't the sound of an animal, especially because it sounded like a human woman. I haven't been back there since. When I was in middle school, I convinced my parents that for summer vacation, we should go to a haunted hotel. So we went to the Menga Hotel in San Antonio. Well, for the first visit, I videotaped walking through the hotel with my dad and best friend. I didn't catch anything except a loud bang while we were rounding a corner. A girl whimper, and someone say, You get down. Since then, I can't find the video. But while we walked through there, dead silence like you wouldn't expect walking through hotel hallways. Me and my best friend also ran up and down the halls late at night, and heard people running above us on the third floor. Excited, we ran up to see who was there, and there was no one. A security guard had actually come around the second time, and we met this really chilled out lady taking photos, and she covered for us. But the lady and I got into a really interesting conversation, and she told us that her daughter and herself were mediums, and that every night at the foot of her and her husband's bed, there was a little boy standing there. She was really sweet, and told her about what we had been experiencing, and never saw her on the trip again. Finally, we came back home, and I entered my room to see one of my frames on the wall fell and shattered. The next morning I woke up, but I felt a hand at the foot of my bed. It was hard enough to wake me, and I knew I felt it by my feet. I remember once I woke up right before 10, and asked if it wouldn't wake me up. It never did after that. I thought I might be going a little crazy, but my dog was sleeping with me on the bed one night, and jolted awake with me the following morning. It was never creepy because that was the extent of the paranormal I would say followed me home. It went away after I complained about it to my friend over the phone. I live in an old, tiny, three bedroom house in an indigenous community slash reservation. After my parents gave me this old house, I asked fiancé and his stepbrother to move in with me to help with the cost. My fiancé and their stepbrother, without fail, every day to my annoyance, would lock the doors and windows to the house. Every. Single. One. My family has lived in that house since it was built in the early 60s, and no one has ever locked the back door until now. Eventually, I adapted and began locking the windows and doors before bed, as part of our household bedtime routine. We became a little family, with our two fat cats and a round husky puppy. Halloween rolls around. It was uneventful, we handed out candy, watched movies, and we all had work the next day. So after doing the window slash door check, fiancé and I go to our room with the puppy. Stepbrother goes into his room with the cats, and everything is completely normal within our routine. The puppy was six months old and very large. He'd always sleep beside our bed on the floor. In the middle of the night at around 3am, the puppy starts crying. Fiancé woke up first, since that was his side of the bed, and got up to take the puppy for a pee. They come back in, but the puppy keeps crying. And these aren't soft little doggo whimpers. They were getting louder and more panicked as time went on. So I get up and offer to take the puppy out again. My fiance grumpily says no, and the puppy stops whining and runs off into the living room. 
we could hear him hop on the old sofa, and with the house falling quiet again, we drift back to sleep. 20 minutes later, we're awoken to the sound of the puppy screaming. It literally sounded like someone was beating it. My fiance and stepbrother both ran into the living room and found the puppy hiding underneath our coffee table, cowering and screaming as if someone were whipping it. The guys do their door and window checks and everything was good. They put away their late night weapons of choice. And that was that. Well, over coffee the next day at breakfast, we began talking about what happened. His stepbrother tells me that he woke up shortly before we did, and had heard when the puppy had started whining. He woke up because he heard someone stomping through the house. He implied our arguing had woken him up, and that my fiance stomping and slamming doors wasn't cool, and likely what caused the puppy to freak out. We gave him a weird look, and explained we weren't even awake at the time. And after some questioning, he said like someone sounded like they were wearing work boots and digging around the kitchen. No explanation for that one. The neighborhood that I lived in was super kid friendly. There were lots of families outside in the afternoon to just chat and let the kids out of the house. Our neighborhood was really safe. So many times our parents would just leave us outside with the neighbors kids. So no adults would be watching us but like the older kids. It had been like that until the summer before I was going to be a sixth grader. My friend and I were playing outside at around 3 to 4pm. And many people were not out yet. So it was just us. Okay. Basically, she was the eldest. She was in seventh grade. And the rest of us were kindergartners, second grade. So she had to look after us. This was the first encounter with the man in the green car. We noticed that this car kept circling the neighborhood. And then there was a big golden car that was parked right next to in front of where we were all going to be hanging out. And he basically double parked next to it so that we wouldn't be able to see him. But he would still be able to see us. My friend's grandma came out to check on us. And she noticed the car but didn't give it much thought. A few minutes passed and she came back out to check on us and was pouring water into the sewage. And she saw the man and told us to get into the house. She even told me not to go home, even though I lived next door and just rushed me inside. I was scared. She told me not to go home yet and to stay there until my grandma picked me up. The man was watching us. She'd never seen him before. And everyone in our neighborhood knew each other. It's uncommon to see someone new. At first though, she thought that he was just picking up someone. But it was way too long. And he was just creepily watching us. So she locked the doors. And my friend and I decided to take a peep through the window. The car waited for a few minutes, then came back after another few and finally left. My friend and I were seriously worried. But after a while forgot about it and went to play in her basement. The next day everyone was outside. It was sunny and windy. All the kids were out even the older kids and the green car returned. This time I saw his face. He looked Asian was mid 30s with long hair. And he had this glare. Every time I saw him he was staring directly at me. I was so scared. I told my grandma and she told me not to worry because there were lots of people outside. I told her he was there yesterday too. And that's when she was like, what the hell? And she was going to confront him. But I told her not to because he seems like a psycho when she could barely walk. Plus there were people outside who were suspicious of this dude as well. So we all just went back home. This happened several times. I don't remember a lot of things because it's been years. The guy never really did anything but stare at us for hours. But 
the thing that stuck with me was that he was always in a disguise. Like he would always try to change some part of it so that we wouldn't notice it was him. For example, he would show up with a fake moustache. The last time I saw him was actually when I was walking to a Halloween party with my sister. The thing was, I was telling her this story about the man in the green car who kept stalking me. And what do you know? The green car pulled up and parked right next to the sidewalk where I was crossing the street. I told my sister that that was the car and the guy and got goosebumps. But that was the last time, unless he got a new car or something. Anyway, it's a repressed memory. And thinking back on it, every time I think of him, I can still feel the glare from his eyes. I really hope to never meet that creep again. To take things back to the beginning, at the time of this, I was 14. I was a competitive dancer, and with that came a lot of traveling and a lot of stays in hotels. On this particular trip, we were going to Fargo, North Dakota. We would be there for five days, so we needed to find a reasonably priced hotel, but was also obviously safe. Me, my mum, my best friend Beth and Beth's mum were going to carpool the four hours to Fargo and stay in the same hotel room. We made the four hour drive and pulled up to our days in we had booked. Everything went as normal. My mum and Beth's mum checked in while Beth and I sat in the locked car. Once our mums came back with our room keys, we got our suitcases and made our way up to our room. We were on the second floor and being in the city for a dance competition, we had tons of luggage. To our disadvantage, there was no elevator in the hotel, only a tiny flight of winding stairs. Let me just explain the layout of this hotel. When we walked into the hotel doors, the check in desk was to our right and two couches sitting opposite each other were on the left. Straight in front of the entrance doors was the door to the pool, going past the check-in desk. You could turn left or right to get to the main floor hotel rooms. At the end of each hallway to your left was the staircase I mentioned earlier. Getting back to the story, we walked into the hotel and took a right at the check-in desk, and we were going to the end of the hall and up the stairs our luggage clunking behind us. Once we made it up the stairs, our hotel room was halfway down the hall to the left. We approached our room, and as Beth's mum tried to use our key card to open the wood door, the light on the door that would usually turn green, saying we could enter, turned red, meaning that our car was not activated properly. So Beth's mum went back to the front desk to get a new card. Me, my mom and Beth waited outside our room joking and laughing about how our trip was off to such a great start. When a shorter, skinny, balding man approached us. He looked to be in his late 20s to early 30s. He approached us and said to my mom, where did you get your tattoos? My mom at the time only had a couple of smaller, less noticeable ones. So you'd really have to be staring at her in order to see them. My mum goes, just a friend who does them back home. He then told us all that if we were interested, we could go into his room and he motioned to it and said that he can give us all some new ink. Obviously, we politely decline and my mum told the man that we were only 14. He mumbled to himself and went back to his room. Just as he entered his room, Beth's mum came back and asked who that guy was. We explained the conversation and then totally forgot as we entered our room. Later that day, we decided to go out and eat at a small restaurant that was a 10 minute drive from our hotel. I was the first one to exit the room 
and at the end of the hallway across from the stairs was the same man sitting on the windowsill looking outside. I kind of gave my mum the look, you know, the look when you don't want to draw attention to yourself by directly pointing or saying, look over there. She casually looked and we gathered up enough courage to walk down the hall towards the stairs. As we approached him, I came upon the shocking realization that he was giggling to himself and carving something into the window with a knife. I let out a small gasp as he turns to me and gently stroked the blade. Me, Beth, and our mums booked it down the stairs and ran to the front desk to alert the guy who was working there. He didn't seem to care, but he told us he would look into the matter. Mine and Beth's mum stood at the desk talking to the man while I asked Beth's mum for the keys so that Beth and I could sit in there safely. She unlocked the doors to the vehicle and I called Beth to follow me. She was texting her boyfriend and told me to just wait up for her. Our mums had just finished talking to the guy. So we were all standing in the doorway waiting for Beth. When I turn around and notice the man standing directly behind Beth, I grabbed her arm and told her that we needed to go. She kept resisting and saying she needed to respond to her boyfriend before we left because she wouldn't have Wi Fi at the restaurant. Finally, I screamed at her to get off her phone and we sprinted to the car and got in. We made the drive to the restaurant and Beth and I were hysterical. Once we got there, we called the hotel to tell them we weren't staying there and we wanted a refund. The manager was reluctant and asked us to come back so we could talk about the situation. I don't know why, but we went back, gathered all of our belongings as fast as we could, throwing whatever we could fit in whichever bag was closest. Beth's mum was so freaked out she was throwing up heavily in the bathroom. I don't know when the police were called, but as we exited our room, the man's door was open a crack and an older woman sat there. I think she was trying to calm down the creepy man. I peeked in and saw three big trash bags under his bed and weapons sitting on the little table across from it. Again, being the idiot that I am, I gasped and the two people in the room turned around. We quickly ran downstairs with all of our stuff and went to a new hotel and a very expensive one at that. The front desk worker at Days Inn was just a part time guy and his shift had just started. He'd got thrown into the situation and ended up being the one we spoke to about our refund since we hadn't even stayed the night there. He gave us our money back and said something along the lines of this should never happen. And I know my boss won't want me to refund your stay. But this is unacceptable. And if they want to find me for helping you guys out, so be it. God bless that guy. And I hope he knows what a godsend he was at that moment. Honestly, I'm glad we got out of there when we did. Because I don't want to know what his intentions were when he got us into his room. And it haunts me every day not knowing what was in those three garbage bags under his bed. I'm just happy that we all made it out alive. This encounter took place on Halloween of 2010. I was a sophomore in high school, not really at the age to go full out partying, and not really the age where I wanted to sit at home with my parents all night handing out candy because I was too old to trick or treat. That day at school, a group of five or six friends and I decided to make plans to roam around the city, wreaking havoc, doing typical 16 year old Halloween stuff. It started out pretty chill. We all got ready and dressed up in our costumes. I didn't have one planned out, but I was a bit eccentric at the time. So I winged it. I wore some purple plants, a rainbow bandana, hippie style, and every other colorful accessory you can imagine. Ultimately, I was a rainbow. 
During our first adventure, we went to Target to walk around and show off all of our costumes. I remember distinctly this lady walked up to us and told us all this crazy stuff. We talked to her about how we were going to play with my Ouija board tarot card and pendulums, as I used to be super into all of that, and her mood instantly changed from friendly to taken aback, almost as if she wanted to run away. She told us she had a twin sister and felt very strange. She told us not to mess with the unknown because her sister was psychic and just knew things. Didn't think much of the encounter with the random stranger on Halloween night at Target. We did play with the Ouija ward, but we neither got possessed nor had a creepy encounter with a demon. That is when the encounter comes into play. It was dark. We were bored. Five of us were in my small room when my parents were home. We had more of a chance getting some excitement by walking around the neighborhood on Halloween than sitting in my room playing board games. We walked around and even tricked or treated a little bit. It was a lot of fun until we passed a large dimly lit vacant parking lot. It was vacant, all but one van that was situated facing towards the street. This time, I got bad vibes as we walked by. Just as we were passing, the window rolled down. Some of us looked back, and some of us kept walking. I stopped and looked back, but it was so dark that all I could see was a faint glow of a cigarette. For some reason, what she said will stick with me forever. She said in a deep, raspy voice, Hey, kids. Wanna come here and get some candy? I don't get a lot of kids where I'm from. Luckily, I was close enough to home at this point, where I could have gotten there quickly if I needed to. And that's exactly what we all did. I'm really against judging people, but I also like to look out for myself and my friends. Maybe it was just an innocent old lady wanting to hand out candy. But at that point, I trusted my instincts and booked it all the way home. Better safe than sorry. It was this past Halloween, and I went out to this mall with some friends after school. We were a group of eight senior guys, but we decided to go trick-or-treating for the last time before it became questionable. Hell, it's even more questionable now seeing six-foot guys walking around in pirate costumes. But hey, we might as well have some fun, right? We went into the mall to find it empty for a bit, and sooner the mall got more and more full with mums and their kids trick-or-treating the different stores. Before we left, we all got a quick bite to eat from the food court before we went to trick-or-treat. Our plan of going about Halloween was not traditional, though. In a nutshell, we would be in my friend's car and would be driving up and down neighborhoods with the take one bowls and dumping them in pillowcases or trash bags before we left. We were on our way to the exit when I had the massive urge to take a dump. After I ate some tacos from Taco Bell, and I don't know how I didn't expect this coming. I told them to go ahead and that I would catch them up. I was starting to sweat from the urge, and I went pretty deep into the mall to find a restroom, finding the sign that said restrooms in a long, white hallway. Now without thinking, I ran into the first restroom, and saw and went straight to the stalls. I remember feeling relief as I went and sat down ready to do my business. Right before I was about to, however, I heard this old raspy voice. Son, I think you're in the wrong restroom. I froze and let out a choke. What? The old and raspy voice showed who she was as she bent down to tell me. You're in the girls' restroom, son. She let out some sort of twisted giggle and I remember his face clearly. Old and wrinkled, white tanned skin 
white hair and round framed glasses with psychotic huge eyes. I was frozen in complete shock and horror as I sat there looking at this man who was in the girls restroom for God knows why. We both stared at each other for God knows how long. The old man broke the awkward silence by saying, you know what, I'm going to pay you a visit. He had this long ear to ear grin with only his lips and was beginning to cackle more showing his brown rotted teeth. At that moment, I knew it was the time to get out of there. All I remember before I took off was seeing him start to crawl under the stool to me. I sat up, not even zipping my pants or putting my belt on, just pulling them up and running. I dashed out of there as fast as I could, looking like I had just crapped myself as I was running out of the hallway. I looked back and saw the old man had started sprint walking. He was about six foot three and wearing an olive khaki jacket with black stained pants and construction boots. I kept booking it until I was out of that mall. I see my friends in their car waiting on me and I ran up to my friend's car and I was shaking as I was putting my seatbelt on. He asked me what was wrong and I told him in a stern voice to start the car. My friend Skylar was next to me asking me why but I cut him off and raised my voice. Box, we gotta go now. He started the car and signaled the rest of our friends group to follow up. We drove out of there and I didn't look back. I have had some other strange encounters with people, some weirder than others, but I never thought that one of these days I would find myself in the position of being face to face with a deranged person in a restaurant. I haven't seen him since, not that I would want to. I just pray that he left them all as soon as I did. But what still keeps me up at night, however, is why. Why was he in the girl's restroom in the first place? We were staying in a historic home in the old girl's wing in room number six. I was around 11 and had not been told this house was haunted. There was only one other family staying in the whole house as it was huge and they were on a totally opposite wing on the ground floor. There were stairs on the floor above us in the main house and at around 11pm someone started running up and down them over and over. Everyone was asleep and exactly at midnight I heard a little girl speak. It sounded like she was in the room with us but I have no idea what the voice was saying but she repeated a phrase three times. Being scared to death, I called my mum and she immediately woke up and heard the voice too. Then my brother and I woke up and he and I both heard a chair in the room squeaking like someone was bouncing up and down on it. Also in the middle of the night, my brother woke up on the floor as if someone had pushed him from the bed. I found out later the family of the house had a young daughter who died tragically and to this day, I still cannot sleep in old homes. I am a short female and love Halloween. I love to dress up to be scary and scaring people and watch them when they realize what happened and start to laugh. The fun kind of scaring, especially with the older kids. So I usually end up helping at haunted houses or at other friends places, scaring all the kids coming up to get candy or going through the houses. This was some years ago that it happened and I was helping make some of the new props for a haunted house that a family had. And since it's a large production, the ones who were helping usually go down there a week ahead and camp out on the large farm. Now it's a large piece of land in the country which is where we have the party part of the haunted house and then the actual haunted house, which is a house that the owner lives in and then starts dressing up for Halloween along with her family and friends. And then the people around the town come to enjoy it. It's got a long drive out to the house surrounded by woods. During Halloween, since I'm quite good at sewing and making stuffed toys, I make some stuffed props. That year they wanted a stuffed Slenderman. 
to stand in the haunted house that people could run into. Slenderman is one of my favourite modern day made monsters, so I offer to make the prop. I also know that some company made those full body suits that had Slenderman morph suits, and I decided I could be semi lazy and order the Slenderman morph suit and just stuff it. Because let's face it, making a full body stuffing is hard and takes a lot of time to do with only a month to do it in. I got the morph suit, stuffed it, and made a very large stuffed Slenderman, and was quite proud of him. He was at least six foot. Can you imagine how hard it is to work stretchy spandex fabric into the shape of a humanoid without it fighting you? I had to use some really stiff stuffing and a few other tricks to keep its proper shape. I didn't want to mess it up. So I sat him in my passenger seat, which of course got a few looks on the road. But that's not the story. I got to the house and everyone commented on how good he looked. And I set up my tent. I have a tent that's set up for one person, or maybe two small people. But since I'm short and wide, it fitted me myself perfectly. After I'd set up the tent, lay mat and sleeping bag and pillow, I noticed I'd forgotten my body pillow at home. I sleep on my side. So I sleep with a body pillow to help me sleep better aligned and not be a bag of achy bones and joints in the morning. It was too late to get it from home. As this was an hour away. And I didn't like driving at night. So jokingly, one of my friends said, Why don't you sleep with the stuffed slender man? Now it seemed weird. But darn it, I hate waking up hurting all over because I slept badly, especially being in a tent on hard ground, even with a lay mat and sleeping bag. So it wasn't that bad of an idea. And of course, everyone thought it was hilarious. And I went to the tent dragging my stuffed large slender man in there with me. I looked like some dog with a huge stuffed toy, trying to get it through my doggy door. Silly as hell. But because slender man was soft and stiff enough, so that I could use him as a decent body pillow for the night, I thought screw it. I told you about my small tent for two reasons. One so that you can understand why I had to half sit up slender man since he was way too long to fit the dimensions of the tent which made me have to pretty much sleep with my body wrapped around his belly and legs. Yes, I looked like I was sleeping on slender man's lap. And yes, to most people who knew it was there, it looked ridiculous. A friend even took a picture of it. And for the second reason is so that you could understand that I was in the tent by myself. Now the tents were near each other, of course. And if the weather whips up, we can escape to the house. But we do the camp out because it's fun. And you can guess there's a lot of people. So we can get cramped in the house if we slept there. The families and close friends usually bunk together. But I'm the type that needs to have my own space. I have autism and anxiety problems. And after a certain amount of time with people I need some space to decompress from being around others. Otherwise I can have a bad breakdown and it's not pleasant for anyone. I was near the larger tent of my friend and her kids. And I unzip my tent and wrap up around Slendy and pass out. I wake up to the sound of a man screaming in horror, not from another tent, but right in front of me. I wear glasses. So all I could see was this blurry figure that was now screaming about monsters and running away from my open tent flap. The screams of this man, of course, woke me and everyone else up. And some of the guys with us managed to catch and tackle him and hold him down while the police were called. I was of course in shock. As this scraggly thin wild looking man continues to scream and cry like a maniac and thrash around screaming about monsters coming to get him and whatnot. The police came out. And apparently this guy was a druggie that was high off his rockers and had seen the tents and broke into mine because it was the smallest. Because he was high and tripping, seeing the stuffed slender man in his mind made him think it was the real deal sitting there waiting to attack him. 
which is why he began losing his mind. While in retrospect this was funny, I was damn frightened at the time, despite the fact the guy had been taken by the police, and I shoved Slenderman into my friend's tent and hid in the corner of her tent for the rest of the night unable to sleep. For the rest of the time I was there, I drove back home as soon as it started getting dark, until the haunted house was open, and then I'd drive home in the middle of the night. Slenderman went on to scare a ton of kids and friends that came to the haunted house. He was a hit, but sadly, lost one of his legs to a very naughty chocolate Labrador of one of the haunted house owners, and had to be disassembled. Though I hope one day to remake him again, once I figure out how to fix his leg properly. I do sanctuary work at festivals and burns. For those unfamiliar, sanctuary spaces are these events generally refer to encampments that are set up specifically for people who are not a medical risk or an immediate security risk, but have probably eaten way too many psychedelic drugs and need someone to keep an eye on them and be nice to them for a few hours. It may involve allowing them to talk through some difficult stuff, going to town on a colouring book, or just providing a comforting silent presence. Trip sitting can be a thoroughly rewarding experience. The team I work with sets up a large, elegant dome tent at events that is open for anyone who needs a break from the festival environment which can obviously be overstimulating at times. We also usually have a few smaller tents, intended for people who may need to be escalated and not too keen on being around groups. However, on the weekend in question, we grossly underestimated attendance numbers and did not bring the small tents. This will be an important detail later on. I was assigned to the late night shift, 4am to 8am, on both the Friday night and Saturday night of the festival. There was a small and low key crowd in the tent on Friday night, mainly folks just chilling and talking quietly, appreciating the music in the distance, and I took a brief note of one fellow in there, who seemed ordinary enough. He wasn't speaking, and his eyes were quite enlarged, but that is not out of the ordinary for guests. He appeared content keeping to himself, so I didn't interact with him much. For some reason, I had recurring thoughts about the guy the next day. It was a small festival, and I saw him walking around a few times with those same dilated eyes and tightly clenched jaw, always by himself. Now this isn't necessarily a red flag at the time, except this happened to be a festival where a lot of people knew each other, and the telltale signs of tripping tend to wear off after about 8 hours. Each time I noticed him, I grew increasingly uneasy, but dismissed it as irrational paranoia and went about my fun. Saturday night rolls around, and I was excited to catch the set of a DJ I liked before my next sanctuary shift. As I was boogieing, I saw the bug-eyed dude about 10 feet away, staring straight ahead, with that same static expression and thousand yard stare. Irrational or not, I felt the need to create more distance between us, and quickly moved to a different part of the crowd. No sooner had I done that, and resumed my dancing, did I look to my left, and there he was, now five inches from my face, eyes like saucers exclaiming, Hi! I was so startled that I booked it away from the stage area, and thankfully bumped into a friend who helped me laugh it off. 4am rolls around, and I'm sharing this story with my co-staff, whom I consider good friends and colleagues. 
The person in question is called G-Man. And not a minute after I finish recounting my what a creeper anecdote, a golf cart rolls up like clockwork. And out of it steps guess who googly eyes. Normally our golf cart transport comes to us via the medics or security team. And they'll fill us in on what they can about the person who needs to help. But whoever was driving this one unceremoniously dumps this weirdo into our care and speeds off into the night without another word. I silently signal that this is the guy I had been talking about, and G-Man takes charge. For reference, I'm a woman, so it would have been more appropriate for G-Man to do so even without the pre-context. Googly Eyes says he needs to use the bathroom, so G-Man escorts him to the Porter John's only to come back alone 10 minutes later. Turns out that googly eyed man was making lewd comments to the women in line for the Porter Johns. And when G man tried to gently redirect him, he decided he was tired of male company and told him to piss off. We never force people to stay at the sanctuary and G man was visibly irritated by the encounter. So it seemed for the best case closed. Right? We decided to check in with one of our homies in security just for due diligence. And it turns out they'd already spoken with the dude. I can't recall why, but it was for a minor infraction. The moment our conversations wrap up, two things happen at once. One, a couple of my friends arrive escorting a young, half nude woman to the tent. So I immediately spring to action. And two, our friend Googly Eyes takes this opportunity to reappear out the darkness like damn Beetlejuice. He hasn't done anything severe enough for us to ban him from the sanctuary since we deal with people in altered states. The threshold for bizarre behavior is very high. But as I mentioned earlier, we were also lacking from the privacy of our smaller tents. The young woman probably would have benefited from some time in one anyway, given her condition, but I particularly didn't want googly eyes anywhere near her. With both of them now here in the same sanctuary space, I did my best to create a physical boundary discreetly as possible. My two friends, both female, stayed with us for a little bit, while trying to make her feel at ease. She was alert, but nonverbal and had been distressed and distorted when they found her. Googly eyes immediately starts inching closer to us, intermittently butting into our conversation, his tense jaw stretched into an unsettling grimace. I can practically feel him eyeing all of us up, especially the girl we were trying to take care of, who was still rather exposed from the waist up. At this point, a G-man and our shift leader who had been roaming around the grounds until then, who we'll call B-Money, and another male team member who was off shift but hanging out in the space, are there. G-Man, who has an eye on the situation, but can't do a whole lot at this point because googly eyes has already flared up at him, and intervening could have exasperated matters. Nevertheless, I'd had enough of him for the night, and quietly go over and tell the guys that I'm uncomfortable. B Money is a pro at this kind of work and immediately develops a plan. He approaches Googly Eyes and gives him a series of odd tasks. Hey man, can you inspect this rock for me? Hi friend, can you watch this sage stick? Googly Eyes is clearly struggling with these complicated instructions and asks B Money to leave him alone. B Money says, that's fine, dude, no worries. But first, can you arrange these colored pencils? At last, googly eyes gets flustered and huffs off, and every muscle in my body relaxes. We have a lovely remainder of our shift, chatting and doing art until the sun comes up. We even get our other guests to laugh a little bit, and by dawn, she is able to talk and walk back to her campsite independently. Sunday fun day on the last day of the festival is magical, but I'm wrecked by afternoon 
and drive home to decompress. The word on Facebook come Monday is that someone was taken into custody by local law enforcement on Sunday evening in connection with some thefts that had been taking place over the weekend. But I didn't get the full story until a couple of weeks later when a team member of ours does a debrief. Turns out that a number of tickets had been hustled and sold at a discount to locals near the festival property, which happens to be in an area of the rural south where you paddle extra fast if you hear banjos. In other words, some tickets wound up in the hands of folks who were not there for the music or the yoga worship. One of our team members had to run off to some Duck Dynasty extras who showed up at our sanctuary looking to get some, demanding to know where them topless women were at. If you haven't already guessed, one of those discounted ticket holders happened to be Googly Eyes, who also turned out to be the guy that got arrested for some of the robberies. Once apprehended by festival security and turned over to county police, they also discovered that he was on meth, hence the eyes and jaw, and was in possession of a handgun, presumably the whole time he was lurking in the sanctuary. Googly Eyed Man, get your stuff together and let's never meet again. Yesterday, I had a weird experience on Halloween night, so I wanted to share it. In 2015, my mum passed away from cancer. Since her death, we made a family tradition to visit her grave every Halloween night to memorialise her. We would go to worship in the church and then light a candle on her grave. This year the church was closed and my brother was sick. So me and my dad decided to visit her grave alone. We drove out at 9pm. The graveyard was completely dark, no lights on the graves. But then we got over to my mum's grave. The lights were lit. We knew it was my grandma who had visited her and lit the candles. We sadly lost contact to her after my mum's death. We lit up our own candles and looked at her grave in silence. I felt comfort watching her grave. I wasn't scared, but it was sad to see all the other graves with no lights. I was surprised the candles didn't blow out as it was a windy night and they were out in the open. Suddenly, I heard a quiet sound coming from my side. It was completely dark so I couldn't see anything. But after hearing the sound the second time, I could hear it was a cat. I just sat down on the ground, trying to find the cat, so that I could hear if it was close to me. My dad watched. He knew I loved cats, so he wasn't surprised I wanted to pet it. The cat was very happy and wanted to be petted. So I began to give him some attention, and then he crawled into my lap. I just sat in silence with the cat watching the grave. My mum loved cats too. She loved our cat at home. He sat in her bed looking out for her to the end. Then, my dad said that maybe it was a cat my mum had sent to tell us it would all be okay. The moment was beautiful. My dad turned on the flashlight and his phone to see that it was a black cat. A black cat on Halloween night, visiting my mum's grave. I continued to pet him on my lap, and after a while he crawled out of it. But then the cat walked over to my mum's grave, crawled over the little fence, and then just stood on the grave the exact place her urn was buried. The cat turned around and looked at us both, and I could feel my mother's presence as I looked into its eyes. And even though I didn't believe in the afterlife, this felt so real, almost as if it were a sign from my mum. After standing there for a while talking about memories with my mother, we went home, but the cat followed us as we walked away. I sat down, to stroke him one final time as it crawled into my lap again. My dad continued to walk to the car. 
He thought I was right behind him, but I couldn't let go of the cat. Just felt a connection. It was so warm, so happy. And I started to cry. I haven't cried a lot over my mum, and I don't know why. But it was at this moment that I couldn't contain myself. It was like the cat was connected in some way to her. I hugged it tightly, gave it a kiss on the nose, and my dad realized I wasn't behind him at that point and came back for me. He heard me crying and came back to comfort me. He knew I wasn't ready to let go of the cat, but he took my hand and we went to the car. I knew I couldn't stay there forever. I am glad I had the experience because it felt comforting and beautiful. This isn't the first time I got a sign from her like this, but I want to know what other people thought of the experience. Thanks for listening. In 1988, I quit my job as a teacher in San Francisco and moved back with my parents in East Sacramento, in their guest house. It was a nice little cabin type, with a small sitting area near the kitchenette, and the sound of shrubbery near my bedroom was relaxing. During the summer, I was taking a refresher course in alternative teaching methods in a nearby town called Rancho Cordova, and I was there for most hours of the morning from 9 till 12, and I would take the bus home. It was a really nice place to live, and the houses were beautiful. Who wouldn't want to live there? Not me. When I'd walk through Sacramento, I'd imagine walking through the busy streets of the hate. I had to be there, so I had no other choice, and the teaching job I was doing to have at Folsom Middle School seemed promising. On a sunny afternoon, I walked home from the bus stop and noticed the neighbor's son, at only 10, was sitting on the parents' lawn. I asked him if he was okay, and he looked at me dazed. There's a man looking in your window, he said. I thought maybe he'd seen my dad, and that was it. I asked him to carry my books while I unlocked the door, and told him it was probably my father. No, he was looking from the outside, he said. Once again thinking he was just a kid with an imagination. What did he look like? He said it was a man wearing a black mask like the Hamburglar. This was California, and David had never seen snow. So it's likely he'd never seen a ski mask, and it sounded like that was what he was describing. For a second I considered reporting it, but it was only the basis of a child who said a man who looked like the Hamburglar was looking in my parents' living room window. I let him inside let him have a soda, and walked him across the street. The rest of the afternoon, I sat on the patio of the guest house, smoking cigarettes and reading Stephen King. I lifted my head up to take a sip from my Coke, when I saw a shadow duck behind the garden shed. It was almost like at the moment when Annie and Laurie are walking home in Halloween, and the shape hides behind the hedges. Almost like that. Cigarette in hand, I walk over to the garden shed slowly. David, if that's you, go home. I looked behind and there was no one there, but beside it there were two footprints where someone wearing heavy boots was standing. I was freaked, but it could have easily been anybody, even the neighbour. I went inside and put on a record really loud, leaving the window open and sitting back on the patio reading my book. I thought if there was someone creeping about, maybe playing music would scare them to thinking someone was home. A knot was tightening in my stomach, and the more I thought about it, the more I was tempted to look up from my page to see if the shadow would jump out from behind the shed once more. I grew up there and never felt like East Sacramento was a place for prowlers. It seemed too much of a sunshine land for that. I blew the thought off, and decided to pick the needle up, turn the stereo off, lock up, and go to an old friend's house until my parents returned home. 
I went to my cousin Cindy's house. She'd just married her boyfriend straight out of high school. Cindy was a kindred spirit, and would go on to marry four more times by 1999 before she had her first son. Call the police, that's what I'd do, she said, rinsing her hair in the sink. She just finished colouring it with food dye. Her husband, Brad, at the time, offered to go over there before he had to go to work at the video store. Brad wasn't butch or strong, but he pretended he was. I felt stupid. A grown-ass adult that was too scared to go home because the bogeyman was hiding in the garden shed. That place always gave me the creeps. It's dark. There's spiders. Cindy laughed. But we never thought there was someone in there, I replied to her. I called my mother at her prayer group, and she came to pick me up. I felt even more pathetic than I did before. I told her what I'd seen and what David said. She said that I was scaring myself and to not be silly. She laughed, and I thought perhaps she was right. That was until I came home to find the kitchenette window in the guest house had its screen taken off, put neatly against the wall. Nothing had been taken, but things had been moved. Odd things. Some records were pulled slightly off the shelf. A picture of an old friend had been placed face down, and there was an empty beer can in my trash can. I don't drink, and some of the food in my fridge had been eaten. My degree was now on a different hook. Either some jackass broke into my house to move some stuff and have lunch, or I was going crazy. After this, I started getting obscene phone calls like heavy breathing and whispers that I couldn't understand. I asked the police what to do, and they told me to put in new locks on the doors and call my phone company to change my number. When I asked them if there was something they could do, they said they couldn't because I had no evidence these things were related, and nothing was stolen. I prepared to move, and decided I wasn't going to wait around to be the victim of crime. One afternoon I'd come home from work to hear the phone ringing. I dropped my student's work on the outside chair, and quickly unlocked the door, picked up the phone and said, Hello? There was nothing. Hello, anybody there? They were calling me a whore in this high-pitched whisper. I'd had enough. I moved that weekend in with my cousin Cindy until I could find somewhere else. My parents never experienced the phone calls and never found their things misplaced. For some time I considered it was a student I gave a bad grade, or someone following me home. I'd like to know who it was. It'll eat me alive otherwise. I've gone on long enough without knowing. And maybe, I will never know. This happened back in elementary school. I was around seven or eight. I haven't thought about it too much in the past years. But listening to other stories has reminded me. However, at school there was the annual Halloween party, where brothers and sisters of my elementary schoolmates were invited. We've always had lots of fun, whether it be eating spooky snacks, wearing costumes and stuff. And my best friend Sarah had a strange costume at the time that involved fake plastic chains, that seemed very real as it was quite heavy. But on to the story. Sarah tells me she had to go to the bathroom, so we both head to the bathroom. I wait for her outside the entrance of the toilet. And another couple of girls go into the bathroom as well, but I don't pay any attention to that. A few minutes go by and I start getting annoyed, because I didn't want to miss out on the party. At least ten minutes go by and I was pissed. I turn around and enter the bathroom. I hear the sound of her chains moving around, but can't tell from which stall it's coming from. I knock on every door and get no reply. I get on the ground and look through the spot between the doors to the floor, in order to ascertain where the noise is coming from. And I find it. Strangely, I see she isn't alone in the bathroom. I raise my voice, 
and ask if she's okay, and who was that girl? There's no reply. I start trying to open the door, as we couldn't lock the doors, so someone had to keep it closed. I'm now panicking and screaming, and after I try with all the force of a seven-year-old, I open it slightly. I see a girl. I knew her. She was the teenage sister of one of my classmates. I ask her what's going on, and she says that Sarah's having some problems and she was helping her. But I couldn't hear Sarah anymore. I kicked her ankle and get into the bathroom. I was scared as hell and just wanted my friend back. As I get into the bathroom, she closes it again using the back of her leg. I look at Sarah and she was sitting on the toilet, her face red, with the chains suffocating her. I began to scream, and that girl slapped me. I was sobbing and crying, and wasn't able to move from the fear. So I began screaming as loudly as possible, and a teacher finally arrives and gets me and Sarah out of there. They call her parents, and the ambulance and my parents bring me home while Sarah goes to the hospital. Turns out that her brother, our classmate, was pissed off by her, and his sister decided to do something about it. I still get chills thinking about what happened, but I've never seen the cops talking to my parents or at school, so I guess they got away with it. Me and Sarah never spoke about it again, and when I tried to ask her what happened, she just doesn't want to talk about it. I don't blame her. This happened on Halloween. I was going as Charmeleon this year. It was hot in Texas, but I enjoy the heat and it really didn't bother me. My dad had taken me trick-or-treating around our suburban neighborhood that night. These houses were known for giving out the best candy, and having the coolest costumes. I knew them as the scary houses. Being the wimp that I was, I kept my head down and tried to scurry past them, knowing that they wanted to scare me. When I had walked far enough, I turned around to see my dad laughing. You can come back, sweetie, it's okay, he said. Everyone was looking at me. Then I noticed a guy standing behind my dad. He didn't have any skin, he was all muscle, dripping blood all over the concrete. It was Halloween, so I thought it was a costume. Then he walked through my dad, like a ghost floating through a wall as if he wasn't there. My dad looked confused, as he saw my face twist into pure horror. I quickly turned and ran as fast as my little legs would carry me. In cliché fashion, I tripped as I was running. I shoveled my candy back into my bucket along with the dirt and grass from a neighbor's yard, and then I got on my feet and bolted to my house. When I got home, I locked every single door and window and began crying. My poor father was still outside, and I remember talking to my mum and her calming me down after that. When I mentioned it to him, he said he hadn't seen anything, and genuinely looked concerned. I never saw the skinned man again, but it still terrifies me to this day. <laughs>